Copy, copy. All right. You can turn me down a little bit. All right, copy that. Well, thank you guys for showing up. Thank you for showing up to the Strong Tower Conference 2020. Uh, let's open up in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we thank you for all that you have. We are very, very grateful that you have given us the gift of salvation. You have brought us here together uh, tonight and for the rest of this weekend here to learn more about who you are and how to defend what we love, which is your word and your gospel. We ask that you don't only anoint my lips, but you anoint the mouths of every speaker, not only speaking here tonight, but speaking tomorrow and on Sunday. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We ask that your will would be executed and your will would be done. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right. So uh, <clears throat> first off and foremost, I just want to let everyone know that all cell phones must be turned off. So if you have a cell phone, a cell phone you have to turn it off. No taking pictures. No talking, um, none of that. I'm so sorry. If so, um, someone will politely ask you to, you know, uh, take your device and put it, move it to your car. Um, <clears throat> anybody who's, this, this event here is primarily for born-again Christians. So if you're a born-again Christian, welcome. Anybody who is not a born-again Christian, um, primarily a Muslim, Please stay. We want you to stay. We want you to ask questions. But if there's going to be any type of interruption, if there's going to be any type of dispute while any speaker is speaking, then we ask you politely to please go downstairs. We will refund you your money, and that will be that. This is not, uh, we're not saying if you're an unbeliever, please just exit the, the premises. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying, if you're going to be disrespectful, then we're asking you to please leave. We are born-again believers, and we're here, and we're going to defend Christianity. We're here uh, to defend God's word, and we will always, like we did in the previous years, the previous strong, uh, strong Towers, we're going to do it here, and the further conferences, we're going to always combat and engage against Islam. So, in that being said, I would like to open up in Scripture, John 4, 24, and it reads like this, God is spirit. Therefore, who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I say as Christians, we could worship God in spirit and truth because we know who, the, who, um, who God is. The God of Islam does not know who the true God of scripture or the universe is at all whatsoever. So we could be bold. And to be bold, we don't have to be, conf we don't have to be arrogant. We could be confident in what we believe and why we believe it. I'm going to have uh, Sister Karen Fisher, and she's going to do doxology, which is worship, for the next 10 minutes. Hey, how are you? <laughs> I think the words are on the screen. Um, George asked me to pick songs that everyone really knows very well, and I'm really hoping you'll sing with me. I don't really like singing. Well, I mean, when you're at home alone, I sing alone. But I, I hope we can all join together and worship the Lord together. The first song is called Thou Art Worthy. Okay, you ready? Yeah?
Dr. Joe Smith has been working with Muslims for over 50 years to establish the New York Center to teach Muslims and Christians about apologetics and polemics. He has two master's degrees. He's also an international director of Sanger Center of Apologetics. Dr. Joe Smith also has a bachelor's in Islamic degree specializing in Islamic There we go. Um, before I begin, I have been asked to flog some books. <laughs> you know how George does. He just hands them to you and says, now, sell them. Well, this one's not hard to sell. I mean, you, does anybody not know what I'm holding? Oh, a few of you. Okay. Uh, corrections in early Quran manuscripts. This was written by Dr. Dan Brubaker, a good friend of mine. Dr. Dan Brubaker and I have go back many, many, many years, and he spent 10 years getting this book ready. But this is not his doctoral thesis. This is what has come since his doctoral thesis, the beginning of many, many, many books. In fact, there's a new one that's just going to be coming out hopefully this month that uh, moves on from this because he's got a good 4,000 of these variants to look at. Variants, what are we talking about? We're talking about manuscript variants. These are differences in the Quran, in the Razam. This is not, this is not the Qir'at that Dave and I and Al-Fadi have been, and, and especially Hatun Tash have been hammering this last year. These are the actual texts. This is the consonantal text. This is the earliest manuscripts that uh, Brubaker's working on. Much more academic and much more devastating, and as far as I'm concerned, probably the Achilles heel of Islam. But this is the first book. Now, there have been many Muslims that have been trying to confront this book. You probably, some of you know about a 290-page paper that has just been put up um, a few weeks ago on academia.edu to try to attack this book. 290 pages. How long is this book? 110 pages. Three times the length to try to take down this book. Well, Dan Brubaker is looking and has looked at it, and he called me up the other day, and he started laughing at some of the things that they've come up with. But he has done a rebuttal. It's just been put up on his YouTube site. If you haven't seen it, go up and see it. And it's only a 20-minute rebuttal, which is fascinating. 290 pages, and you can rebut it in 20 minutes. Now, on top of that, there have been some, there is one specifically, a good re, uh, uh, confrontation of this book by a man named Sidki, Haitham Sidki. That's going to take more time, and that has now been done. So Dr. Brubaker has now come up with a rebuttal. That will be in a journal this month. You'll see it. What are we? This is November, right? So it should be at the end of this month. We'll let you know as soon as it's out. But this is the beautiful things. This is called peer review. And as he writes these books, he is getting peer review. On top of that, David and I have really got Dan to put this material on YouTube because those he can put up every week. And those are being put up every week. And so far, no one has been able to deal with those because this is just 22. Actually, it says 20 on the cover. It's actually 22. Everybody should get this on your li in your library. Please get it. And for those who are watching live, please get this book. Dr. Dan Brubaker on the, early, the corrections of the early Quran manuscripts. This is ancient history. I'm surprised it's still here. I'm surprised you have copies of this, George. Uh, this is the video of, of, of the British Museum, looking at the Bible in the British Museum that I made, I think, in the last century. So shows how old it is. And I've got gray hair, probably older than most of the people in this room. And I did this when I was very young. But this is looking at all the artifacts 
that are in the British Museum. God bless the British. They went everywhere, stole everything, and put it into that building so we could look at it. And in that building are all types of artifacts, stellas, obelisks, murals that, con that support many of the Old Testament peoples and also places and events. And this is what we need in the Old Testament to show that when the Old Testament was written, we've got the right man at the right place doing the right thing at the right time. But most people who walk past these objects don't even know what they are. And so I decided I'm going to put together a tour of the British Museum, just looking at all the references that you can see in First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, First and Second Samuel, the book of Jeremiah, the book of Isaiah, even the book of Genesis. Ooh, doo -doo -doo. And that's the stuff that we're going to, that, that this does. It looks, and it shows you that we, in the Bible, there is really, there is, they haven't been able to find one piece of evidence. Dr. John Gluck uh, said this, there has not been one piece of evidence that controverts a properly understood biblical statement. No other piece of ancient history, uh, literature can make that claim except the Bible. Now, two other books that I've been asked to get rid of is, well, are Al Yahud, by Sam Solomon. Do you all know who Sam Solomon is? Okay, if you don't, beware. We sick him on you and you don't, you don't survive. This is also by, oh no, this one is by Abd al Fadi. So this is another one. Is the Quran infallible? This is an old classic, and this has been a classic for Iran for many, many years. Please get it, because it does go through an awful lot of the arguments within the Quran. So that's an internal critique of the Quran. This one looks at the problem that Islam has had with Jews and looks and, and unpacks it probably, probably better than I've ever seen anybody do it. Sam Solomon is, is an amazing individual because he has not only memorized the Quran in Arabic, he's also memorized it in Urdu and in English, three different languages. How many of you have done that? How many of you have even memorized the Quran? How many of you even want to waste your time trying to do so? But this was while he was a Muslim. And that's why he is so dangerous, because he understands it. But he doesn't just understand it as far as memorization. He also unpacks it. He was the head of all the Islamic courts in Pakistan for nine years. And he's not even Pakistani. Show you the ability of this man and the enormous acuity. And it's so good to have him on our side. And I have worked with him for many, many years. David and I, we went to Ethiopia with him. Remember that, David? And so... Uh, enormous amount of respect for this guy. Anything he writes, grab it, get it, use it, put it in your a library, and make sure that it is a material that you can use. All right, I'll put these aside, and I'll get into what I'm supposed to talk about tonight. George has asked me to talk about violence. Not that I'm going to do it or have anything for it, but to actually try to support, uh, not support it, but try to understand how is it we answer it. And this has been a difficulty, I think, for a lot of Christians. You get into a discussion with a Christian, uh, Muslim, and obviously violence does come up. And if it doesn't, make sure it does come up, because that's one of the best polemics we have. And it's been good because Muslims don't know how to deal with this question from their side. They have not been able to answer it uh, second and consecutively, and they do not really know where to go to find support to, for this idea that maybe Islam is a religion of peace. I remember back in the 1990s at Speaker's Corner, no one ever talked about Islam as a religion of peace. So this was not really a debatable subject back in the 1990s or earlier. It was because of 9-11 and really because of what happened here in the United States, that event that shocked the whole world, that suddenly Islam had to look for a new narrative. And that's where we saw diametrically it changed overnight. It happened all right after 9-11. And so by October, suddenly Islam became a religion of peace, and it made my job an awful lot easier. Because I was getting beat up all the time in Speaker's Corner. It was no fun. And then after 9-11, suddenly no one touched me. That was off limits because they were a religion of peace. And here's the difficulty. You can change the narrative, but you've got to support it. So how do you change a narrative that you have used for 1,400 years? And there's such a historical backdrop to it. And there's so many examples. And as we're now seeing, since 9-11, it has almost exponentially increased in almost every detail and in almost every country. Well, for the Muslims, the dilemma is they've got to go back to Scripture. They've got to go back to the prophet. You've got to go back to the book of the man, and you've got to go back and you try to support it in both those two authorities. And the difficulty has been for Islam trying to find support in the Quran. And that's why you've heard all these references about internal jihad versus external jihad. 
But what they have done, and probably the best way, the best thing that they have done is to take the same argument and throw it on Christianity and say, listen, we, may, we don't really have this problem. You're only bringing it up because of these lone wolves. And these are nothing more than lone wolves that you're seeing around the United States and Europe and these other countries. But we don't really have this problem because when you go back and when you look, go back at your scriptures, when you go back to the Old Testament, when you go back to places like Joshua 6, verse 20, or 1 Samuel chapter 2, when you go to 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses, I'm sorry, chapter 15, sorry, did I say chapter 2? It's verse 2 and verse 3. When you go back to those references where you have God saying to Joshua, go into Jericho and kill all men, women, and children, and all living things, that's called genocide. There's no reference to genocide anywhere in the Quran. The same thing in, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 2 and 3. Kill everything. Not just men, but everything. So how do we defend that? And this is the beauty of our Bible. The great thing about our Bible is that you do have an Old Testament followed by a New Testament. And when we look at the Old Testament, we look and we ask and see what's happening in that period, at that time, and at that place. And that's called proper exegesis. And so we've always done that. In fact, the Muslims are trying to copy us now because they realize that that is such a great that is such a great tool to use that they're now starting to do that in the Quran. The difficulty you can't do that in the Quran if it's only a book that's been put there or that was created in 22 years. But you can if you're looking at Scripture, if you're looking at the Bible, which started with Moses in 1400 BC and continued all the way up to the first century AD with the New Testament, then you need to look and see what was God doing in 1400 BC that he no longer does in the first century AD. And we do that all the time, even today. We look and see what laws exist here in the United States that made sense or when they were created, when the Constitution was put together in 1776. But today, do those laws still work today? And we have to come to conclusions. And the same thing you must do with the Bible. A proper exegesis of any scripture must go back to see what the author intended, the author at that time intended. And that's why you need to go back and see what was happening at the time of Joshua, 1400 B.C. What was happening in 1 Samuel? We need to go back and see what was going on. And to understand that, you need to go to some other scriptures to give some background to why they had to kill all men, women, and children. Why God commanded this. This is God telling Joshua to do this. And you need to start with Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17 gives the background to what's going on. And it's referring to the Israelites who are coming out of, his, of captivity, 400 years of captivity there in Egypt. And as they were coming out, they were being attacked by the Amalekites. So who are these people? Well, we understand who they are by looking to Deuteronomy 20. In Deuteronomy 20, it stipulates exactly who these people are. And when you find out who these people are, you realize they only make up six tribes. Let me name them to you. Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. Remember, they're all the sites. Just remember, anything with ites is probably them. And those are the six. And it's only those six were the ones that stopped the Israelites as they were coming out of Egypt. They confronted them. They attacked them. They seduced them. They took them away from their God, and they seduced them to other gods. That's why God says, because of what the Amalekites, the Hittites, Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Herod, Hivites, and the Jebusites, because of what they did back then as they were coming out of Egypt, he says in verse 14 to 16, he would, God would be at war with them from generation to generation, and he will blot them out of memory. Eradicate them completely. That's in Exodus 17. To understand the background to that, you need to go to Ezekiel 16. So Exodus 17, come to Ezekiel 16. And in Ezekiel 16, it says exactly what these Canaanites and these Jebusites and these Hivites and all the ites, what they were doing to the, Egypt, uh, to the Israelites as they came out of Egypt. And it's great because you see what God, what he does in Ezekiel 16, he spends the first 15 verses showing how he dressed these people, how he nurtured them, how he clothed them, how he washed them, how he made them look beautiful. This is the, these are the children of Israel that he had nurtured, that he had dressed, that he had chosen from the very beginning. Beautiful imagery there. And for the whole 15 verses, you see how God, over and over again, came to these people to make them look beautiful, to get them, prepare them for when the Messiah would come. And then in verse 15, it changes. And from verse 15 to verse 24, 
It says that these people that God had chosen, had put aside, had dressed, nurtured, who had, who, who had washed and made them look beautiful, they started prostituting themselves to other gods because of all these ites, these six tribes. They prostituted themselves. And then what they also said, they sacrificed children. And which gods is it talking about? Well, it actually names the different gods that they prostituted themselves to. The gods of the Egyptian, the gods of the Philistines, the gods of the Assyrians, and the gods of the Babylonians. So it's all listed there in Ezekiel 16. Thus God was fulfilling what he said in Exodus 17. That had to be fulfilled. But how is he going to do it? And here's where you need to go to Deuteronomy 20. So I'm really giving you three verse, three chapters to go to. Start with Exodus 17. Go to Ezekiel 16 to give you the context. Sorry, context 17 to give you the background of specific in 16. And then jump to Deuteronomy 20. Because in Deuteronomy 20, then God does, he says, listen, there are two types of people that you're going to have to, that you're, that you're going to, have to attack amongst these six tribes. There are those who live near you and those who live far away. And he had two different sets of rules and regulations depending if they were near or if they were far. If they are far, it says, and the far ones, he starts with verse 10 in Deuteronomy 20. These are rules of engagement. First of all, you're to offer them peace. If they accept peace, then you put them into forced labor. That's in verse 11. If they attack you, then you respond, you attack them, kill them, but only kill the men. Don't kill the children, don't kill the women, only kill the men, verse 13. And keep all of their provisions for yourself, verse 14 and 15. So those are for those who are far away. Why? Because they're not going to seduce you. They're not going to be a real problem for you. Those who are near to you are going to be a real problem. And so in, after verse 15, he then goes to, now I'm going to give you what you have to do with those who are near to you. And those who are near to you, eradicate them completely. As I said I would do in Exodus 17, for what they did in Ezekiel 16, destroy them, completely annihilate them in verse 16. Completely destroy, eradicate these six tribes. And then he lists the six tribes. The Hittites, the Amorites, Canaanites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. So verse 18 gives the answer as to why. So that never again will they seduce you from me. Never again will they take you from me. I'm a jealous God. I'm a jealous God. All right, so what's the conclusion? Just looking at that Old Testament environment. There are very few Old Testament references. In fact, those are the only two I've ever heard. Joshua 6 and 1 Samuel 15, where God says to eradicate, destroy everybody. Men, women, children, even all living things. And to understand why he said that, you'd need to go look at the context. And the context was only for those six tribes at that place, at that time, nowhere else. Nowhere else did God ever do that. Now, let's look at Islam. Islam and Muslims say, well, we don't have any genocide. There's no example of genocide in Islam. And I would say, well, what about Sodom and Gomorrah? What about Surah 7, Ayah 89, or chapter 15, verse 59? Because there you see genocide. There you see God demanding the same thing for Sodom and Gomorrah that he demanded there in Joshua and for Samuel. They say, yes, but um, so you have that in the Bible as well. Exactly. It did happen. It is a historical event. But what I like to use, I like to use Muhammad himself. He's always a great character, and this is, when, uh, this is something we're going to debate tomorrow about because David and Sam love Muhammad. I don't. They love I shouldn't say that. That's wrong, isn't it, right, Sam? It's not you love Muhammad. You love to take him on. You love to belittle him. You love to desecrate him. You made a whole career out of it, haven't you? See, for me, I, I, I think Muhammad is actually, I can understand why Sam and David love him so much. Because he is easy to hold up and use it as an example, as we need to do with violence. You need to use him as an example. Take a look and see what Muhammad did in Medina. Go to Ibn Hisham, not Ibn Ishaq. Remember, this is Ibn Hisham. We don't have Ibn Ishaq. Go to Ibn Hisham, 833, and see what he says about Muhammad there in Medina. Remember, Muhammad was not from Medina. Muhammad was from Mecca, so it tells you. Now, remember, I don't believe anything I'm going to say in the next 15 minutes, all right? 
just so you understand for tomorrow, all right? I don't believe a thing I'm going to say in the next 15 minutes. Nonetheless, I still have to go back to their authority. I still have to go to where they're at. So he comes from Mecca. He goes to Medina there in 622. He takes maybe 80, maybe 200. We don't know exactly how many. He takes these people from Mecca with him. He comes there as a guest. He's there to, to arbitrate between the Ansar and, of course, the Ansar and the Jews, because there's a problem there, because the Jews, as Jews do everywhere all around the world, and they always have done, they are very affluent, and they usually take over the commerce. So there is a rivalry between these two groups. He is neutral. He is from Mecca, so it's a great to use him as an arbiter. He comes up in 622. He's already, had, he's already burned his bridges there in Mecca. And the first thing he does, he tries to make a relationship with the Jews. It doesn't work. After two years, that breaks down by 624 then. So he's been there two years. He then has his first battle, the Battle of Badr. And there at the Battle of Badr, he defeats the Meccans. And after he comes back from the Battle of Badr, he then confronts the Jews because they hadn't helped him. They hadn't, helped him. They hadn't supported him in that battle. And he throws the Banu Kainuka family out, the first of the major three major Jewish tribes. The next year, 625, there is a... A second battle, this is the Battle of Uhud. The Battle of Uhud, Muhammad gets gravely wounded, almost dies from his wound. He's angered by what had happened. He comes back to Medina. He is angered that the Jews didn't come to his aid at that time, and he throws out the Banu Nadir family. So two tribes, two families of the Jews, of three of them, have now been thrown out. Two years later, they have a third battle. And this is the Battle of the Trenches. Neither side win. They both, it's a stalemate. So as a result of that, something needs to be done. And he's angered that the greatest, the biggest of these Jewish tribes, the Banu Qurayza family, did not support him in that battle. And so he confronts them. For 21 days, he confronts them. After 21 days, he finally takes all of the men in groups of 10, and he slits their throat. 800 of them. 800 in one day takes all the women as concubines for his men and the children as slaves. Now, have you all heard this story? Have any of you not heard this story? Okay, so a few of you. Have the Muslims heard this story? Yes, they have. It's in the Sirah, the Sirah to Rasulullah, which would be the biography of the Prophet Muhammad, 624, 625, 627. Muhammad had only been in Medina for five years. He was a guest, remember. He was not a native to Medina. These were all natives. These Jews had been there for hundreds of years. I don't believe a word I've just said. Nonetheless, they had been there for hundreds of years, right? And yet here is this guy. He's only been there five years, and he throws out two of the tribes, slits the throat of all the 800 men, takes the women as concubines and the children as slaves. So by five years, there are no Jews left. Oh, there may be one here, one there. I'm talking about three, the three major Jewish tribes. They have been eradicated. What do you call that? I call that genocide. That's the definition of genocide right there. Why aren't we using that in public? We've used it at Speaker's Corner all the time. And it shuts down this argument because there's nothing they can go to. They can't go to any other piece. They have to go back to Ibn Hisham because Ibn Hisham is right there in black and white. So if you want to use an example, that's probably the best example. But don't just stop there. Take it one step further and say, okay, I'm here in London. Let's say you had a mayor who's a Muslim, and he comes and he's a mayor of London. Oh, wait a minute. You do have a mayor who's a Muslim. And let's say that he decides that he is now going to be the arbiter between man and God, and he's going to create a treaty like a constitution of Medina, like Muhammad did when he first moved there to Medina. And let's say that his, he's the arbiter of man between him and God, that every one of us who is not a Muslim have to sign that treaty. By default, we have to sign it. And those of us who refuse to sign it, therefore, we're open to the same, the same consequence that those who refuse to sign the treaty in Medina, including these three tribes, did not sign that treaty. Look at their names. Look at the names who signed the treaty. Their names are not on that treaty in the Constitution of Medina. Proving that today, any Muslim who comes to power in any city if they are going to follow Muhammad, should do the very same thing Muhammad did. If he is their model, if he is their paradigm. And see, that paradigm is not just for the 7th century. It's for today, every year, for you, for me, for anyone. There is the difference right there. So when the Muslims come at us and they say that we have to use and we have to obey Joshua 6 and Joshua and 1 uh, uh, Samuel chapter 15, they say, no, 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 no. I don't have to go back to Joshua. I don't follow Moses. I don't follow Abraham. I don't even follow David Wood. 
or Sam Shamoon. I follow Jesus Christ. And I go and see what Jesus says about genocide. In fact, Jesus does talk about this in Matthew chapter 5, doesn't he? Verse 15. I have not come to destroy the law. That's the Mosaic law. That's what we're talking about. I have not come to destroy it, he says. I have come to fulfill it. And the lovely thing about Jesus Christ, he then gives an application immediately. He immediately says, and he gives six different applications right there in the same chapter. For you have heard it say, that's the Mosaic law, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I now say, turn the other cheek. You have heard it say, to love your friends and hate your enemies. There's the Mosaic law. That's 1400 BC. That's the law of Moses. But I now say, to love your enemies. Oh, I love Jesus. What a man for today. He doesn't destroy the law. He still recognizes the law is there. But he talks about a whole new law, a whole new covenant, a whole new testament. And that's what we're following today, the New Testament. That's why when I talk to Muslims, I say, listen, you've got to follow Muhammad. Look what he did in Medina. I follow Jesus Christ. Look and see what he did in the first century A.D. But then there are some problems with Jesus. There are four problems. Let's look at the four problems. Let's look at all four of them and see what you come up with. So let's start with Luke 19. Here he is. Jesus is speaking, and he talks about the king who sends out his servants. And then he says for the last servant who did nothing with the money that he was given. All the others invested it and came back with more than what was given. But this last servant, he just hid it in the ground, and he came back and gave what he was given him. And what did Jesus say to him? Bring him before me and kill him. See, Jesus is violent. He wants us to kill him. Well, the way to answer that one is just to go to verse 11. Go to 11, because that's in verse 27. Go to verse 11 and see what this is. This is a parable, and it has nothing to do with what Jesus is doing then. This is the parable of the end times. This is the last judgment, folks. And this is what God is going to ask every one of you. What did you do with what I gave you? How are you going to take the kingdom of God that I have offered you? And if you've done nothing with it, then like that service, you, you will be killed. Nothing at all about what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. Did Jesus kill anybody? Do you recall him ever? I don't remember that happening. So that's why we need to be careful that when you look at a verse, make sure you look at the context, explain it to your Muslim friends, and then show that this is something that they're going to have to... Are they ready for this question? Are they ready for the judgment day? What about whipping the money changers? Matthew chapter 21, John chapter 2. In Matthew 21, he there, he whipped the money changer and threw them out of the temple, proving that this Jesus was a violent man. No. Go back to John 2. That's probably the better reference to go to. Go to verse 13 and verse 16. Because in verse 13 and 16, it says very clear that Jesus didn't touch anybody. He whipped the animals to get them out. How else are you going to get animals out unless you whip them? Even today, we do the same thing. What did he do to the money changers? With the authority of his voice, he drove them out of the temple. That's exactly what we're called to do. We are not to use weapons of this world. 2 Corinthians 10. We use principalities and power. Verse 5, we use arguments. and Take every thought and make it obedient to Jesus Christ. That's what Jesus was doing. The authority of his voice. All right, let's go to Luke 22. He's there in the upper room. They're having dinner. They're at the table. And he says, go sell your cloak and buy swords. That's a hard one. What are you going to do with that one? Well, t look and see what happens immediately after he says that. Peter picks up two swords. Where does he pick them up from? From the side? By he, where he, uh, his side? No. They're on the table. What are those swords doing on tables? No one's bothered to look at that. Okay, but with swords, they're rather unwieldy, aren't they? 
So what exactly are they? Well, look at the Greek. The Greek is makaira. What is a makaira? A makaira is only about 12 inches long. It's a dagger that every, every man who is worth his salt used in the first century. It was probably the most important tool for somebody in that part of the world in that age. It's something like today. I understand all of you Americans, all you males, you have Swiss Army knives, right? It's like a Swiss Army knife. You have it. Okay, well, shame on you. And this is why. Why is it so important? Because you use it for everything. A makaira was used to pluck your teeth. A makaira was used. Yes, Paul used the makaira to also to cut the tents. And a makaira was used. It was there on the table because the British had not civilized the whole world with forks, knives, and spoons yet. And so therefore, they needed the makaira in order to cut the meat. And they'd put it between their teeth and, and hopefully they didn't get their noses. So a makaira was absolutely essential. What was Jesus saying? I am leaving you, but get a sword. Make sure you get a makaira. Why? Well, the very next day came the application. Because the very next day, he goes there to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's been arrested there, and Peter took out the same makaira that he had just lifted. And you remember, he only lifted two makairas, only two swords. We say sword, we should really say daggers. He only lifted two of them off the table, and what did Jesus say? That's enough. That's all you need. To start an insurrection for the whole world? <laughs> the very next day, Peter took his makar out and cut off the ear of the servant. What did Jesus do? He took the ear, put it back on the servant, turned towards Peter, and said, put away your makaira. For he who lives by the makaira that way dies by the makaira that way. You are not to use the sword for my kingdom, not for my defense. Even when he went to the cross, he would not allow anybody to defend him, including right there in the Garden of Gethsemane. I love to use the example of Muhammad again. Take a look at Muhammad did when he was castigated and he was mocked when he first moved to Medina. Asma bin Marwan, a poetess, wrote poetic verse. She was from Medina. She was a native of that town. He wasn't. And so what did he say to his disciple, Umar? Who's going to take care of this woman for me? So Umar, he goes that evening, he goes to where she was living. She was there suckling her baby there on the bed. She had six babies, uh, six children, sorry. And while she was sucking the baby, he takes the knife and plunges it through her heart, kills her immediately. Comes back the next morning, tells Muhammad what he had done. Muhammad turns toward him and say, blessed are you for what you have done for, to your, for your prophet. That's the example of Muhammad. Look at the example of Jesus. Look at the difference. Who is the better man for today? Who is the model you want to follow? Come on home. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Let's end with Matthew 10. Matthew 10 is my favorite one because I think it's a hard one for a lot of people to read. I know Christians don't like to speak about it. I know a lot of Christians don't like to preach about it. Uh, I have yet to hear many sermons on Matthew 10 because it's a difficult passage because it's the commissioning of the 12 disciples. The 12 disciples are going out. He's going to send them out. And there in verse 34, he, Jesus says, I have not come to bring peace. I have come to bring a sword. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with that? That's a hard one. Until you go back and look and see what the author intended. Proper exegesis again. Go back and see what he intended. And when you read that chapter, it's the commissioning of the 12. He's about ready to send them out. And as he's sending them, he said, I'm sending you out as lamb before wolves. And then he promises them five things. If you go in my name, you're going to be hated. How many of you tonight have been hated for Jesus' name? You're going to be persecuted. How many of you have been persecuted for Jesus' name? You should all raise your hands. You're going to be jailed. How many of you have been thrown into jail for Jesus' name? I'm not. You're going to be flogged. You're going to be beaten up. How many of you have been beaten up for Jesus Christ? I have. And finally, you're going to be killed. I'm not going to ask you how many of you have been killed. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Those are the five things that Jesus said would happen to every one of the disciples. What a commissioning that is. Do we get commissioned like that today? I, don't get, I never got commissioned when I was ordained. A lot like that. And yet that is the commissioning that Jesus is sending the, the 12 disciples with that commissioning into the world. Every one of those disciples was hated. Every one of them was persecuted. They were all thrown in jail. Every one of them was flogged. And yes, every disciple except for John was killed. They all received their commission. We have forgotten about that. We don't like to go to Matthew 10. And it's in that context you need to read verse 34. 
For I have not come to bring peace, I have come to bring the sword. I have come to set father against son and mother against daughter. This sword is not something you're going to use. This is going to be used against you. This sword is going to be used by your own family. Look at Hatuntosh right now. She should be here. She is supposed to have been here. She can't come. Not just because of visa problems, because this woman is running for her life. We may lose Hatun. This woman has been abused. She has been persecuted. Yes, she has been beaten up. I remember back in 2016, she came to the workshop. She was on my team. We were to get up on the ladder that day. She came hobbling in in crutches. She had a, a cast on her foot. She had broken ribs. She had a neck brace around her neck. I said, what in the world happened to you? She says, well, I was in a mosque. This woman has been into 400 mosques all by herself. Walks in uninvited. Five men jumped me. They beat me up, broke my ribs, broke my foot, took me outside, put a rope around the tree branch, and they were hanging me when I finally got into my pocket and was able to push the rape alarm. Some Polish neighbors heard it, came in, they jumped on these five guys, and they rescued her. Now, she was sweating profusely, had a high fever that day. I said, you're not getting on the ladder. You get back to the hospital. She refused to go to the hospital. She got up on the ladder with me that day. And for the next three months, if you go back to 2016 and look at all of the different videos that we have of each Sunday, you will see she'll, she has a kerchief around her neck to protect so people don't see. She didn't want the world to know at all what had happened to her. She has never, ever gone public with that. She wouldn't even help the police. I remember that after we had finished that day, I said, you know, Hutton, they're going to kill you. She said, well, it's all your fault. I said, my fault? She said, you asked me to read Acts chapter 17, 18, and 19. So I went back and read chapter 17, 18, and 19. And there I saw Paul going into Laodicea, Cappadocia, Berea, there in Ephesus. And everywhere he went, he got beaten up. He got thrown into prison. Twice they tried to stone him to death. He caused a riot in Ephesus, and finally they killed him in Rome. And she says, I want to be like Paul. It's all your fault, Jay. I want to be like Paul. Folks, Hattuntosh exemplifies what I see in Matthew 10. I wish she was here so you could hear. She's only five foot two, just a small little girl. And tomorrow we're going to tell you what she has done in just the last year. Amazing woman. Because she takes that commissioning absolutely serious. The sword we are not to use. There will be no peace if you preach the gospel correctly. If you preach the gospel correctly, day in and day out, they will hate you, they will persecute you, they will throw you into prison, they will beat you up, and yes, they will kill you. Some of us need to receive our commissioning. And then he says in verse 38, whoever does not take up the cross, which means suffering violence, and follow me, is not worthy of me. We should expect the sword against us if we preach the gospel properly as they did the first century. But nowhere do I ever see that we are to use the sword. Never do we use the sword. We don't need to use the sword. The gospel is that strong. Thank you. All right, put your hands together again for uh, Dr. J. Smith. My goodness, he was very eloquent. I, I was really, really impressed when you said it two or three times, Hizzites, Canaanites, and said it so many, I mean, I, I can't even say it one whole time. You know, this guy said it two or three times. There you go, ites, ites, ites. Um, <clears throat> well, tomorrow he will be having a panel discussion with David Woods. Speaking about David Woods, Dr. David Wood is going to be, I'm sorry, um, no, please forgive me. We're going to have a testimony from a former Muslim, Sister Nadi, Nada, excuse me, yeah. Let's put your hands together for Sister Nada. You got them excited. They thought David Wood was next, and they just get me. Um, and especially being sandwiched between Dr. J. Smith and David Wood, I'm, um, it's intimidating. But um, my hope tonight is just to share um, what God has done in my life, 
how good he is, how personal he is, and how he uses everything, you know, as cliche as it is, everything for our good and his glory. And so I'll start with uh, my family background. My parents are uh, Palestinian. They were born and raised in the West Bank of Israel, and they came to America after they were married. And all they wanted was one son. That's all, that's all they asked for. But God had other plans for them, so they had eight girls and no boys. Yeah, and um, I'm the youngest of, of the eight. And uh, my parents are devout Muslims. My mom passed away in May, uh, but my dad remains a devout Muslim till this day. He um, is one of the most devout men that I've ever met. He um, is constantly reading his Quran, um, praying. And, you know, I, in May, when I went back home, my family's in Northern California, I woke up um, to use the restroom at about 3 a.m. And my dad is uh, sitting there reading the Quran everyone else is sleeping. And that's just the type of man that he is. And um, so this was a household that I grew up in. Um, My parents never forced it on us, um, on their children. They uh, hoped that we would all follow in their footsteps, but uh, they never made us, you know, go to the mosque or um, learn about it. You know, it was really just through their own faith that they hoped that we would get it. And Uh, My youngest memory of God, though, was when I was five years old, and I remember knowing that God was with me everywhere that I went, that he loved me, and even like someone in the bathroom, this is my second bathroom reference for tonight, I don't, I'm not going to talk about bathrooms the whole time, I promise, but I just remember um, knowing that God was with me, and I can talk to him, and it was a very, you know, just a personal relationship. And almost like some kids have um, imaginary friends, well, that was God for me. And I knew his, uh, he wanted me to just love others, and he loved me so much. And that was, um, I knew that wasn't what my parents believed. Uh, they were very much, and uh, my dad still is, trying to attain closeness with God. And, um, you know, there was a lot of emphasis on really trivial things, such as not eating pork and even gelatin and marshmallows and, um, you know, just these weird things that I just thought, no, like the God that I know, and I thought I was the only one in the world, but the God that I know um, isn't really looking at that, and I don't have to face a certain direction or recite certain words when I pray to him. And so that just shows you how God really works on us personally. And um, anyway, so a little bit more about my sisters and my family. My um, Four of my sisters didn't graduate high school. Uh, they had arranged marriages. Uh, the youngest was 14. And these were uh, arranged marriages from uh, men that my parents picked. Uh, they were usually older from Palestine. They would take my sisters to Palestine and um, my, they would come back when married. And um, it was an Islamic marriage because it's obviously not legal. Um, in America to have that kind of a marriage. And um, my even my parents didn't graduate middle school. So they're very uneducated and education wasn't prioritized, especially, you know, my parents never wanted any girls. So um, it was just, you know, we're there to get married off and not be a burden on the family anymore. But I'm standing in front of you today as um, not only a Christian, but a lawyer and a lawyer, a First Amendment lawyer for religious freedom and representing churches and ministries. God is really good. But I mean, it wasn't through the hardship and the struggle to get here. And one of the things that um, unfortunately that I had to go through um, was childhood sexual abuse from the age of six to 16. And this was by a man that my parents took under their wing, Um, a Middle Eastern immigrant. He was just at the house all the time, every day, and my parents really trusted him. And there was never that open communication in my family where I could talk to my parents about anything or 
that they would ask, you know, how I was doing. Or um, again, it goes back to even though they loved us, it was, you know, we're, women are just supposed to be quiet and, um, you know, not disturb anything. And, you know, you're going to get married and that's it. And so, um, and I just, my personality is being a peacemaker, just not wanting to cause conflict, never um, have the courage to open up and um, to, to tell them anything. And so um, the abuse had escalated over the years. And um, when I was 16, it finally ended because um, it had escalated to rape and I was pregnant. And I told my sister, because I had to, this, you know, it, at that point I didn't have an option and I remember I couldn't even bring, say the word, so I had to write it down. And um, she told my parents, because this guy was still coming over every day. And my parents' reaction, they didn't ask any questions or comfort me at all. Um, it was just, you were getting an abortion. That's it. And they didn't ask, you know, how long it's been happening or how I was doing, uh, nothing. And so um, that's what happened the next day is um, my dad and my sister took me to an abortion clinic and I got an abortion. And um, that, even at the abortion clinic, they didn't ask who, who it was or um, was it abuse. Um, they didn't tell me how far along I was or give me any information, didn't talk about adoption or parenting. It was just you know, just going through the motion. I was one of, you know, many, just as many as you are sitting here were women in the lobby going through the process. And it was really like an abortion factory. And um, so that, I was 16 at the time, and that marked the time that the abuse stopped because my parents confronted this man and he ended up fleeing. Um, like he left the house right away when my parents confronted him and then left the country. And so um, that's when, you know, I, from the age of six to 16, it was kind of like I was just like this empty shell and just going through the motions. And I don't even have very many memories um, of my life during that time. And so uh, this marked when I was able to just live, you know, and to be free in a sense. And so um, it wasn't until uh, about a year later, I was 17. And my friend's mom in high school uh, was a Christian. And my friend had invited me to her house, and I remember meeting her mom. And her mom was like, what, like the typical Jesus freak, like, hello, my name is Janine. Do you know that Jesus loves you? Do you know about Jesus? And I thought she was absolutely crazy because she would not stop talking about this Jesus person. But what stuck with me was... Um, she had, like, there was a familiarity of spirit uh, that I, there was a light about her, and the way that she would talk about God was, like, the same God that I had always known, and so to me, it was, like, someone else knows that same God, too, and um, I had so many questions, though, uh, but the most powerful thing, what I, and I know I'm in the company of like really brilliant apologists, but my story is so much like feelings based, which is weird because I'm an attorney and very logical. But, but I mean, when God had put that Holy Spirit there and that's how I had like communed with him and I met this other person who had that same relationship, I just thought, wow, it's, it was so powerful and she would pray. She had so much boldness. She would pray for me, you know, even just in the doorway in the living room of just, you know, can, can we pray? And she would grab my hands. And I remember just feeling the Holy Spirit like so overwhelmingly and being like filled with emotion. And I just thought, well, there's something to this. And she, uh, I wanted to learn more. So she invited me to her church. And um, it was one of those things where I thought the pastor had like tailored his sermon to me, come to like learn later after being a Christian, that's how God works, especially through pastors. But it was uh, the pure gospel of what, what Christ did, why it had to be that way, what it means for me. And after the church service, they had arranged for me to have lunch with the pastor. And so that was a time for me to ask questions and just, you know, 
what's this whole deal about Jesus and uh, these three gods? How it's so inconsistent. And I was still 17, so I wasn't um, like that deep into these issues. I was just a high schooler, but I wanted to know, you know, how is it that God can forgive you for all of your sins in the future too, that you could you could just keep sinning basically, and you are definitely going to keep sinning, and God just forgives you. It seemed unjust to me, but this, the gospel stayed with me, and so um, I didn't know if I really believed it, but it had so much power to me, and it kept me interested, and so um, I graduated high school, and I went to college. It was two, I went to college two hours away from my parents because I just wanted to get away and be independent. And I thought that I wanted to be a police officer. Um, And so I was a criminal justice major. It was a very liberal college, uh, Chico State, up in Northern California. And I was a women's studies minor. So I did take like philosophy classes as well and religions of the world just to try to learn, you know, what else is out there? Um, I kind of knew, um, and I did also study Islam because I thought, well, maybe maybe there is something that I just didn't understand from my parents and watching them live out their faith and what they taught me about Islam. Um, but really, I mean, it. <laughs> I'm God really blessed me to kind of show me that, no, absolutely not, especially, you know, being... Um, all about women and empowerment and learning about how Muhammad treated women. And it's just disgusting. So um, thankfully, that was never really an option for me. But um, God continued to bring Christians into my life, especially Christians who knew about Islam and who were able to answer some questions and Um, just be loving towards me and tell me about Christianity and the history and um, answer some of the intellectual questions. Um, And one of those was uh, one of my employers when I was in college. He just saw that I was interested and so would use every opportunity to talk to me about both faiths and compare them. And um, he invited me to go to his church. And so I was about 21 I went to the church and um, I started going on Sundays because it made me feel good and it was like positive and encouraging and I thought, well, this is great. But um, Monday through Saturday, I was just kind of doing my own thing and I just thought, well, I like to go recharge my battery on Sundays at this church. But then one day they did the, um, you know, like the profession of faith. And I think it was Easter and at that, that's the point that I remember raising my hand and knowing, okay, I've narrowed it down. Like this really is the one true God. This like, there, that's it. And, um, but even then, you know, they gave me a gift bag with a coupon for a donut, a mug and a Bible. And it was just like, okay, see you, you know, hopefully I'll see you next week. And that Bible just stayed on my nightstand and I didn't, I mean, I, it's, I didn't know how to read it or that I should read it or that there was anything relevant to me. So it wasn't until about two years later, and I still hadn't told my parents because it wasn't, you know, my faith wasn't an integral part of who I am or, you know, it was, again, a Sunday thing. And so um, it was about two years later that just going through heartbreak and really understanding and seeing that. I didn't, I, everything this world had to offer was just empty and it left me feeling empty. And um, the one thing that I can stand on and rely on is God. And so I um, committed, I was in a really dark place and I just committed to reading the Bible front to back and um, fasting for three weeks, doing the Daniel fast. And that's when just everything changed. And it was like the Bible came to life for me and um, I just was in a Bible study every day. I remember like trying to seek out a Wednesday night Bible study, a Monday night Bible study, and just every day to have something. And I was still in college. I was in my last year. 
And at this point, so I would go see my parents every weekend. Um, well, not every weekend, but I would try to come back and, um, you know, just maintain that relationship because I still love them. I respected them, even though I, you know, didn't believe what they believed in. And I remember praying to God because it was a two and a half hour drive to see them multiple times. Um, you know, I opened the door so that I can share with them this hope and this faith and um, that I can share with them about you. But I didn't want to disrespect them. I didn't want to just walk into their house and be like, well, everything that you guys believe is a lie. And um, so I didn't know how to do it. And so one day, as I was praying um, and I got to my parents' house, my mom, um, I sit down and talk to my mom. And she says to me, um, are those Christian earrings that you're wearing? And I was like, what? They were, they were normal, just like beaded earrings. And I thought, okay, well, like, I knew it was God bringing it up. And so I said, no, and I took off my earring and I showed it to her. And I said, but if they were, then I would still wear them because I am a Christian. And she just like was shocked. And she called my dad into the kitchen where we were. And she said, she was like, this is what she just told me. And they sat me down and um, just tried to tell me about how um, I was brainwashed and um, who I've been talking to, that Christians don't even know what they believe in because there's a different church type on every street corner. They don't even agree with themselves. Um, she talked about, they talked about like abuse within the church and it's all about money and like, of course the three gods, you can't worship three gods. So thankfully at this time I was able to respond to them and answer some of their questions and shed light on some of these things and talk about what God had done in my life. But um, my mom ended the conversation by saying, um, if, if I choose uh, Jesus, then um, I'm choosing to not be their daughter. And she framed it in that way of like, I'm making the choice to, to not have a relationship with them. And I remember thinking, you know, I, I knew Christianity wouldn't solve all my problems, but I had no idea that it would wreck my relationships. I had no idea the sword would be used against me. Um, I just thought it would bring me joy and peace and comfort and, you know, everything's going to be great. And so um, I went home and I was crying on my bed and I opened my Bible and um, one of the first things was Matthew 10 that I had read again, and um, it was Second Peter where God says, you know, you should be happy if you're persecuted for my name's sake. Don't be persecuted for being a liar or a cheater, but if you're persecuted because of me, then you're blessed because the name of Jesus rests upon you. I think it's Second Peter 4, and so I just immediately breathed a sigh of relief, like, okay, I'm doing something right then. Uh, but it was still heartbreaking uh, that my parents didn't want anything to do with me. And, you know, I normally would talk to my parents on the phone every day because they just wanted to see, check in, see how I was doing. And they didn't talk to me for two weeks, which was like a lifetime for me because you know, my mom is the type that thinks I got in a car accident if I don't call her one one day, you know, just thinks I died or something, just a worrier and um, constantly wants to know we're okay. Uh, but um, during those two weeks, I just sought God and God revealed to me that like, yes, it's, this is, this is okay. You know, you, you really are glorifying me and um, this, th this is how it should be. And so, um, after those two weeks, though, my parents had called me, and but my mom called me and just like acted like nothing was wrong, and hi, how are you? How's the weather? And so praise God, they didn't disown me. It was just like this bluff, I think, that they had called, and they saw that I, you know, I was serious. This was my faith now. And um, they really just throughout the years have seen what God has done through me, how it completely transformed me. And They've been able to meet other Christians uh, through me, and my dad walked me down the aisle seven years ago in a church. It was his first time in a church. Yeah. 
And so, but even after like, you know, reading the Bible, fasting and understanding things more clear and getting more mature in my faith, I still hadn't dealt with the abuse or the abortion. I just thought, well, God forgave me and I have my whole life ahead of me. So everything's going to be fine. And then it was in my, um, after I had graduated with my criminal justice degree, I knew that um, I, you know, I'm not fit to be a police officer for so many reasons, partly because I cry at like the sight of, you know, child abuse or social work video. I mean, it was just, and I'm, you know, not the most physically able person. So um, I didn't know what God's plans were. And he just through other people, especially there was a Christian young girl my age who um, was just a kindred spirit and she was going to law school and she said, have you ever thought about it? You know, your family could really use a lawyer and lawyers can do so much good in the world. Like we can be more than advocates for people. We can actually like go to a courtroom and fight. And so I just laughed because I was just like, well, my parents, you know, my background and my sisters, half of them didn't even graduate high school. So I had never considered um, getting a law degree, but I thought I'll try it out. And so just God kept opening doors. But even throughout law school, I didn't know what he was doing. You know, surely I wasn't your typical lawyer. I didn't, I wasn't necessarily after the money aspect. I don't really like to argue. And um, I just didn't know where I fit, you know. Uh, but I just knew that God had me there. and He kept opening doors and um, helping me be successful throughout. And even like through e- passing the bar and everything, he was just there the whole way. And everything was just, he just kept guiding me. And it wasn't until after I had graduated and passed the bar that I met, um, I was in Marietta, which is about an hour away. And I met this Christian lawyer who had a religious liberty law firm, and I wanted to just see, like, how are they putting their faith with their, um, with their career? And so I w- went to the office, and anyways, he hired me, and um, I ended up working on a pro-life case. So in 2016, the California legislator passed a law that required pro-life pregnancy centers to post basically a referral for abortion on in their lobby. And I just thought this, you know, no, I didn't even really think anything about my own past or anything. I just put that in a box and put it to the side and, you know, just thought, okay, I don't want to ever deal with it and I don't have to. But um, this case intrigued me because it was compelled speech. And Um, I just thought that's, you know, the First Amendment, and legally that is insane. And so I took on the case, and through doing that, I was able to meet um, pro-life counselors, so post-abortive counselors, and um, just understand more about development. And at this time, I had been married for a year to an amazing Christian man, and um, we were pregnant with our first child. And so I was pregnant. I had this pro-life case. I was reading about um, child development and learning about, um, you know, just processing the grief of what I had done. And um, just being able to do that, though, in like my office and privacy and being able to talk to these counselors without them knowing anything that they were really ministering to me when they um, when they were talking about um, abortion grief and um, just getting through that. And so um, I would go to court too, and I was as big as I am now. This is our second baby. And people would marvel that, like, this pregnant attorney is representing a pro life case. And especially after we had won the case. So in 2018, um, a California judge declared that that law was unconstitutional. Yeah. And then it, um, ADF, another legal organization, took that case to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court declared that it was unconstitutional, so now no state in our nation could pass a law like that. Yeah. So before this, though, I never, like, thought I would be talking about my abortion or sexual abuse or anything like that, but 
I knew like how much God had redeemed that and how he was now using me to advocate on behalf of the unborn in the courtroom and just everything that he had brought me through um, in my life. And so, um, yeah, that just gave me an, an avenue to share, um, especially in the pro-life realm, about just how gracious our God is. And so anyway, all that to say, that's my story. And now we'll get to a brilliant mind like David Wood and stop talking about feelings and bathroom and emotions. Need help going on there? You sure? Okay. Wow, that was truly, truly an amazing testimony. God bless you, sister, for the courage of coming up here and just, I mean, she said, she stated that she was a, she was a, a little girl who was very timid, who was afraid of confrontation, very quiet, reject, rejected anything that had anything to do with drama, and what the devil meant to be bad, God used it to be good, right? <clears throat> for those who love him, Romans 8. But now look at her. She's confident. She has the, the boldness to come out here and to give her testimony. And she's a lawyer. And that's all she does is cause drama or defend drama or, you know. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Next, we're going to have um, David Woods. And he's going to be talking about Mohammed's multi-personality, uh, personal, I'm sorry, Mohammed's multi multi personal uh, of the Quran. Now, <clears throat> something about David Woods. Uh, he is a Christian apologist who had partnered with M2M for many years. He is also the director of um, Acts 17, and he has over 50 public debates with Muslims and atheists, usually in a public hall or in front of a university audience. Everybody, the myth, the man, the legend, the philanthropist, David Woods. Check, check. It's kind of a messed up move. Right before that, Sam said, yay, the cure for insomnia. But uh, Sister Nada, I wouldn't be worried about uh, being in the middle here because uh, you were way better than Jay. I'm just trying to mess with Jay because uh, we're debating tomorrow, so I'm going to going to have them all psyched out before we even start. You know, Jay, uh, Jay mentioned Sam Solomon. That's a weird dude. Mentioned Sam Solomon, knows the entire Quran in multiple languages. Some of you are thinking, wow, I wish I had that brain power. No, you don't. The Lord tends to balance things out, right? If he makes your brain super turbocharged in one area, I guarantee some other parts of your brain are not working very well. And that dude's a perfect example. Super insanely smart and nothing else, right? So, so yeah, we, 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 we went to Ethiopia. We were um, giving talks in front of, you know, various leaders, pastors, politicians, judges, things like that, uh, breaking things down for them. And for like three days straight, I'm trying to get this dude to laugh. And I'm just being hilarious there, right? I am, I am throwing my best stuff out there, and all I ever get is. So for three days, I'm doing this, and eventually we're at this, uh, we're at this Christian seminary. And we have an Ethiopian friend, Johannes, and we're at this seminary, and I, pour, I was pouring this, um, this uh, caffeine powder into my water so I could drink caffeine. And uh, Yo Johannes is sitting there with Sam Solomon. I'm pouring this caffeine powder into my water. And Johannes from across the room said, hey, David, what's that stuff you keep pouring in your water? And I said, oh, it's this cool stuff called mind your own business. And I just went back to what I was doing, right? Sam Solomon's sitting there like this. Six hours later, I give this dude a granola bar. And he starts to eat the granola bar, and he goes, you know, David, 
when you said the stuff is called mind your own business? That was funny. And then he just, he bursts out laughing for like 45 minutes straight. Like he had been holding in all his laughter for the, for the previous 12 years and just starts cracking up over there. And so that's what I'm saying. That's weird. Anyway, that's the weirdest dude I've ever met in my life, with the exception of Sam Shamoon, who has a similar problem. His brain works really well in one area, not so much in other areas. So those are the two weirdest dudes I've ever met. And for the record, I have been in multiple mental hospitals. And in those multiple mental hospitals, I've met people, I've met people with multiple personality disorder. Speaking of multiple personality disorder, let's talk about Muhammad's multi-personal Quran. Did you catch that transition? That was good stuff right there. Nobody, nobody getting insomnia tonight, see? <laughs> All right, so Muhammad's multi-personal Quran. I'm sure you've heard some objections to the doctrine of the Trinity. Trinity doesn't make sense. How can God be three persons in, in one God? And if Muslims think that's a problem, boy, they got some problems they don't know about yet. And they're never going to hear about those problems from their leaders. They have to hear about the problems from us, or they will never hear about them. And that means we have to learn them so we can share the problem with them and make them rethink their, their position. So let's get into this. We're going to start with a different kind of example, right? You want to see the problem, because the problem is going to happen over and over and over again on pretty much every issue. So this is a quote about the Quran. We'll start off with um, the claim about the preservation of the Quran. We'll eventually get to the multi-personality. So this is a quote from an award-winning Muslim apologetics book on miracles of the Quran. Masar Kazi writes, Muslims and non-Muslims both agree, notice, even non-Muslims agree, that no change has ever occurred in the text of the Quran. Jay, do Muslims and non-Muslims agree on that? No change in the Quran anymore? Hmm, yeah, I didn't know that either. It is a miracle of the Quran that no change has occurred in a single word, a single letter of the alphabet, a single punctuation mark, or a single diacritical mark in the text of the Quran during the last 14 centuries. Now, if you've been following what's been happening over the past few months, you might have heard about the, the holes in the narrative, right? The holes in the narrative, the infamous Yasser Qadi interview where he said, I don't want to talk about this. Please don't make me talk about this. All I'll say is there are some holes in the narrative. And then he left them with that, right? Um, but basically, Yasser Qadi was being pushed on how to reconcile um, some various problems with the claim that there's only one Quran perfectly preserved and some other issues, and he really didn't want to talk about it. Because if he had said, yes, one Quran, he knows he would be um, laughed out of academia for saying that at this point. But if he said, nope, there are different Qurans, well, then he's in a lot of trouble with the Muslims who have been raised on this claim that the Quran's been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. But what I want to draw attention to is this kind of pattern that I keep seeing over and over again. You've got the Muslim scholars and apologists. They'll tell their followers something. It's usually something that's totally, completely wrong. So they'll tell their followers, the Muslim population, the Quran's been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. It's a miracle, unlike the Bible, which has been changed and corrupted. So you go tell your Christian friends that. And then the Muslims run out. Ha ha, our book's been perfectly preserved. Your book's been corrupted. That's why you should all become Muslims. And then eventually, over time, some Christians start looking into the history of the Quran. And they start pointing out, what are you talking about? According to Muslim sources, entire chapters came up missing. Large passages were lost. Verses were eaten by a sheep. Even if you go to modern Qurans, you can find different Qurans, different Arabic Qurans in different parts of the world. This is one of the great things that Jay and Hatun did on Speaker's Corner. They actually brought them, they actually brought a bunch of them out there, dozens of them. So what are you talking about? So here's what happens. The Christians then tell the Muslims, no, you're wrong. There have been changes in the Quran, and there are different Qurans even today. Then the Muslims go back to their leaders. Hey, you told us only one Quran perfectly preserved right down the letter. 
And then their leaders will make some excuse. Oh, but you know, the kirat and the ahruf and this and that. And then they run back to the Christians. Aha, we've got the answer. And then the Christians eventually look that stuff up. And the Christians respond to the Muslims. Then the Muslims go back. And that's when you get, okay, there are some holes in the narrative. They can't keep, they can't keep denying it, right? Because they, at this point, they just look like liars, right? People like Yasser Khadi. And he is. I've got proof. So this happens over and over and over again, and we're seeing it. We're seeing what happens when you keep pushing, and they finally are forced to admit something, how this starts a kind of tidal wave. And this happens over and over and over again. And what I'm saying is we need to keep pushing. So let me give another example. So Muslims are also told the Quran is a scientific miracle, not just a miracle of preservation. It's a scientific miracle. So someone like Zakir Naik will tell his followers, the Quran is filled with scientific miracles. It's amazing. No one could have known this stuff. So Muslims run out. Christians, haha, our book is filled with scientific miracles. Muhammad couldn't have possibly known these things that are being revealed. And some people are actually impressed with when they hear this. But they rarely, unfortunately, bother to actually go and check things out. But eventually some Christians start reading the Quran and start finding some passages to bring up. Here's one. Surah 18, verses 83 to 86. They will ask thee, Abdul Karnain, supposedly Alexander the Great, say, I shall recite unto you a remembrance of him. Lo, we made him strong in the land and gave unto him, uh, gave, un gave him unto everything a road. And he followed a road till when he reached the setting place of the sun, When he reached the setting place of the sun, he found it setting in a muddy spring and found a people thereabout. We said, O Dul, o Dul Karnain, either punish or show them kindness. So Dul Karnain finds the place where the sun sets, finds the sun sets in a muddy pool. Way out west, you can go there. There are people who live there. So we bring this up. Hey, Muslim friends, you told us scientific miracles. Um, what do you do with the sun setting in a muddy pool? So they go back to their Muslim leaders. They go back to Zakir Naik, right? Zakir, what do we do? You told us scientific miracles. And you can actually look at Zakir Naik's responses on this. Oh, when it says there, what it says there, when it says reach the setting place of the sun, you know, the setting of the sun can refer to time, you know, like night. So if you do that, the, make, the problem is, he even says, the problem is solved. Direct quote from Zakir Naik. The problem is solved. Now notice, that, that makes no sense, right? And he followed the road till when he reached the time of the setting place of the sun. What, what are you talking about? Now it doesn't make any sense. He's talking about the place he reached, right? And then, of course, you point out that Muhammad in Sunan Abu Dawood, their hadith collection, actually says the same thing. And he's clearly not talking about time. He asks one of his followers and says, do you know where the sun goes when it sets? He says, no, you know, you're the prophet. He says, it goes and sets in a pool. So, the response doesn't work. But this is the pattern you see over and over and over again. The Muslim leaders give the Muslims a myth as if we're never going to investigate it. And then the Muslims go around using that for their dawah, using it to refute Christianity. And then the Christians eventually look some things up, respond to the Muslims. Muslims go back to their guys. Guys give them some superficial response then take it to them, which satisfies them, because the response isn't really meant to be a refutation. It's meant to calm these guys down, because they're starting to get nervous. And they're starting to think that there's some holes in the narrative, so you have to, you have to uh, calm their doubts, right? But if the Christians just keep on, if the Christians keep going, right, all of these things break down. And so this isn't just true of these myths about the perfect preservation of the Quran, of the scientific miracles, you'll find the same pattern if you start getting into some theological issues. I'm bringing this up because this is an awesome direction to start going in. And this will be cool because uh, Anthony's debating tomorrow. He's debating Shabir Ali on the doctrine of Tawheed. So that's the, the Islamic doctrine of oneness. Anthony hasn't shown me his opening statement or anything, but I know Anthony has some pretty phenomenal material on this and that it's kind of wide open. So what I'm saying is that we're starting to get some cracks in the confidence of lots of Muslims on an issue like the preservation of the Quran. If we keep going after all these issues, wow, I think, uh, I think we're going to see some, uh, some awesome things here real quick like. 
So, cool area to go in is more theological direction. So follow the same pattern here. Surah 33, 56 of the Quran. Surely Allah and his angels pray for the prophet. O you who believe, pray for him and salute him with a worthy salutation. Now, if you look in lots of Quran translations, it'll say Allah and his angels praise the prophet or send blessings upon the prophet or something like that. If you look it up in the Arabic, it says they pray. In fact, who was, uh, who was talking about the Bridges 10 Kirat compilation? Who was I talking about that? I was talking to someone earlier. Who was that? You don't even remember who you are? Anyway, wait, was it you? Were you talking about the Bridges 10, 10 Kirat compilation? Okay, were you supposed to raise your hand then? Because I, I said. So this is, you're familiar with this, right, Jay? The bridge, that bridge is a 10 kirat comp compilation. Go to Surah 33, 56 in there, and look what it says. They, they, they give their version, and then they say, and then they say in a note, literally, it says prayers, right? So literally, it says prayers. And guess what? Well, you know, you might think that, that should be a problem if Allah is really obsessed with showing that he's this, you know, absolute monad of a deity, he shouldn't be saying that he prays. And they say, ah, well, you know, it means something else there. It means something else. Well, anything you say that he was trying to say, there are perfectly good Arabic ways of saying that without saying that he prays, right? Why did he use that? Especially when he spends the rest of the Quran bragging about how clear his communications are. So no matter how you look at it, it's just a problem. Even if you want to say it means something else, you're still stuck with why does a God who really, really wants to convince people of this absolute oneness. Why is he using that, especially when he constantly brags about being so clear? And then an additional problem would be what happens when you go to the Hadith and you find all kinds of passages about Allah praying. You've got some problems here, right? But if you follow what happens, it's the same pattern, right? Muslims tell, Muslim scholars and apologists tell Muslims, you see, our theology is this crystal clear, pure, oneness. The Christians had this confusing stuff about the Trinity. And then Muslims go out, ha ha, your theology is all confusing. Ours is easy. A child could understand it because you know that's how you come up with a, the correct definition of God. If a baby could understand it, it must be true, right? And what happens if we start looking up some of these problems? We'll go through a couple and then we'll get to the multi-personality of the Quran. But you bring up something like this. They'll go back. Well, it says this, their leaders are going to give them an answer, right? Well, you know, there it means praises. No explanation whatsoever, no basis in the language whatsoever, but they'll say it. Then they'll run back to you and insist upon it, right? So you just have to start doing some work and then showing them, well, here, I mean, even your own sources say it, means, it literally means Allah's praying. Um, and then you, you break it down to that. Why is your God, who claims to be perfectly clear in his language, why is he using a word that means something completely different from what he's trying to say. Because Allah has that problem a lot. Allah says, fight those who do not believe in Allah. Allah, what do you mean? You ask Muslims. He means only fight people who are attacking you first. Why didn't he say it like that then? Especially when he's perfectly clear. So, same point, same point. And, and the point I really want to make here is when you bring up an argument, you hear an argument from Sam Shamoon or something like that, or Jay Smith. You go use it with your Muslim friend, and you get shot down. Don't, don't, don't get all discouraged and, wow, he refuted me. There's something wrong with the response. There's something wrong with it. Do some more investigating, and then you can find it, and then you can expose it, and that's what you have to do. This is Muslims are trained to have superficial responses on a lot of these issues. You, have to, you just have to keep pushing. Here's another one. This is one example. I don't want to give too many of these because uh, I don't want to steal Anthony's thunder tomorrow. But uh, I love this one, Allah's shin. You read the Muslim sources, Allah has all kinds of body parts. Now, Christians, we would tend to interpret those passages the same way we would interpret passages in the Bible, which talk about uh, you know, God's eyes seeing things, right? We're not thinking literal eyes. We're thinking that that's... You know, that's anthropomorphic language to help us understand God's omniscience, right? If you're talking about God's hands or something like that, we're thinking that this is anthropomorphic language to help us understand God's power. 
And so we think, oh, you know, when the, the, the Muslim sources are talking about Allah having all these different body parts, it's just doing the same thing. Um, no, not according to mainstream Islamic theology, not according to the earliest Islamic theology, not according to Salafis. These are literal body parts. And the reason they argue this is these don't make any sense if you're trying to interpret them anthropomorphically. So here's an example. This is from Sahih, Sahih al-Bukhari. This is a very, very long hadith. No way we'll read it here. It would take almost the entire time to just read it. So here's a section. I'll give you the gist, though. It's basically Allah is showing up to different groups at the judgment, and he's taking on different forms. And then he's appearing in these different forms, and Muslims are sitting there seeing him in these different forms, and they're trying to figure out what's going on. And then um, the prophets are going to speak. So here, we'll, we'll pick it up right there. And none will speak to him then but the prophets. And then it will be said to them, be, be said to the prophets here, do you know any sign by which you can recognize him? By, by which you can recognize Allah? Because he's appearing in all these different forms to people. Is there any way you can know the real Allah when he appears? They will say the shin. And the prophets know this. They will say the shin. And so Allah will then uncover his shin whereupon every believer will prostrate before him and there will remain those who used to prostrate before him just for showing off and for gaining good reputation. So is there a way, if Allah were in front of you taking on different forms of different things that different groups have worshipped over, the, over the, you know, the, the millennia? Allah is taking on all these different forms. Is there any way you could recognize the real Allah? The prophets say his shin. And so Allah is going to, lift up his robe and say, there it is. And they're going to say, ah, it's the real Allah. If, if this is figurative or what in the world does any of this mean? They have a bunch of things like this. And so the classic understanding of this is that this, this is referring to Allah's actual body parts. They'll say the body parts are not the same as human body parts. We can't understand really what the body parts are like, but uh, yeah, Allah has body parts. And so think about this when someone's making fun of, ah, you believe that Jesus is God when he had a body. What are you talking about? What are you talking about right here? Your God's got a body. Only difference is in Christianity, the word became flesh. He wasn't that way from eternity. Here, your God is just always at least a shin. He's got some eyes, got a couple of right arms and things like that. But So the point is, if Christians learn some of this, someone starts coming to Christians making fun of the you know Christian theology, you start pointing some of this out. Guess what? They don't know this. They don't know this stuff. All right. Now let's get into the personal Quran. Not the multi-personal Quran yet. The personal Quran. The Quran is a person. The Quran is the eternal speech of Allah. But the eternal speech of Allah is a person. This is interesting because in Islam you have Allah and His eternal speech and the eternal spirit who proceeds out of him, the spirit, according to the Quran, appears in the form of a man. So the spirit is personal. It proceeds eternally from Allah. Allah's speech is eternal, being spoken eternally by Allah, and yet it's a person too. What do you got there already? Notice, Allah, Allah's eternal word and his eternal spirit. Starting to sound like a bad copy of Christianity. Uh -huh, I think so too. But the Quran is personal. Check this out. Recite the Quran. Sahih Muslim, 1874. Recite the Quran, for it will come on the day of resurrection, interceding for its companions. The Quran is going to come interceding for its companions. How's, the, how's a book going to do that? Well, he tells us. It's from Muhammad. The Quran will meet its companion on the day of resurrection. So his companion, a Muslim. The Quran will meet its companion on the day of resurrection when his grave is opened for him in the form of a pale man. The Quran's going to appear in the form of a pale man. Hey, Veda, did you know that Muhammad bought, owned, sold, and traded black African slaves? And yet, notice what the Quran appears as, a pale man. Why has got to be pale, Muhammad? Huh. All right. In the form of a pale man, it will say to him, 
do you recognize me? He will say, I do not recognize you. By the way, who's speaking here? The Quran and his companions. It will say to him, do you recognize me? He will say, I do not recognize you. It will say, I am your companion, the Quran, who kept you thirsty on hot days and kept you awake at night. So notice, the Quran appears as a pale man. The Quran is personal. And by the way, there are tons of passages in the Muslim sources about the Quran um, interceding and, and so on at the judgment. So it's speaking, remembers things, intercedes. This is a personal agent. But not that simple. The multi-personal Quran. Sunan Abu Daud, 1400. There is a surah in the Quran. This is, again, Muhammad speaking. There is a surah in the Quran which consists of 30 verses. This is Surah 67, I believe, Surah Al-Mulk. It will intercede on behalf of its companion until he is forgiven. Notice, there's a surah. That's chapter 67 of the Quran that will intercede on behalf of its companion. So wait a minute. The Quran as a whole appears as a pale man, but the Quran, one chapter of the Quran also appears. Okay, well, maybe that's the only person in the Quran, right? Wrong. Sahih Muslim, 1874. We read the first part. Now let's continue reading. Recite the Quran, for it will come on the day of resurrection, interceding for its companions. Recite the two bright ones, Surat al-Baqarah and Surat al-Imran, those surahs two and three. For they will come on the day of resurrection as if they were two clouds, or as if they were two shadows, or as if they were two flocks of birds in ranks, pleading on behalf of their companions. So these are two chapters of the Quran appearing as flocks of birds pleading on behalf of their companions. Let's read one more along those lines. Jamiat Termidi. An-Nawas bin Saman narrated that the prophet said, the Quran shall come and its people who acted according to it in the world, Surat al-Baqarah and al-Imran, those are chapters of the Quran, shall be in front of it. So you've got the Quran, but then you've got individual chapters in front of it. An-Nawas said, the messenger of Allah stated three parables about them, which I have not since forgotten. He said, they will come as if they are two shades between which there is illumination, or as if they are two shady clouds, or as if they are shadows of lines of birds arguing on behalf of their people. Shadows of lines of birds. Notice this bird theme, right? Individual chapters are these flocks of birds. But guess what? They're personal agents. They're, argue, what's this area here? Arguing on behalf of the people. Individual chapters of the Quran, arguing, pleading, interceding, individual chapters. Now, it doesn't say all 114 chapters of, well, that would be today's Quran. All 114 chapters of today's Quran are these personal agents. But I think you can, you can gather that, right? Muhammad keeps talking about individual chapters of the Quran being these flocks of birds to intercede for you. Well, I think you've got a situation where you know, Muslims say, ha, huh, you dumb Christians, you think one plus one plus one equals one. Well, you think one plus one plus one plus one plus one, all the way up to 114 equals one. But it would actually be 115 because you have Allah, and these are all the Quran. So notice, the Quran, there are 114 personal agents within the Quran, at least. That's assuming we don't say, wait, flock of birds is a chapter. Maybe the individual verses are individual birds, in which case you have a lot more. Let's just go with the 114, 114 personal agents in the Quran, pleading, arguing, testifying, things like that. And yet they can all appear as one man. Now, Muslims, what was your objection to the doctrine of the Trinity? Because if you're saying, well, three persons in one God is kind of confusing. Well, what do you do with God and his eternal spirit, which is a person, and his eternal word, which is a person, but his eternal word, which is a person, is also 114 persons within that one person. What do you do with that? Because that sounds kind of confusing to me. Now, all those Muslims who heard from their leaders, the Christians are so confused in their theology. Ours is so simple. God's just one. How many of them do you think have been told anything I just said? Notice, that's from their prophet. That is from their prophet, and that information is kept from them by their leaders to give them a false confidence in the simplicity of their religion. And what you're looking for is you, as the Christian, bringing the information 
from their prophet to them that then forces them to go back to their leaders. Can you explain this? Can you explain this? Can you explain that? Can you explain this? Guess what? You're going to get shot down. They're going to come back with some superficial answers. you got to keep pushing, right? Because eventually, they're going to go to their leaders and say, I don't think that makes sense. And what you're going to get is this sort of light switch moment where everything sort of tilts into place. There's a turning point. And the turning point you're looking for with Muslims, this light switch moment, is when the Muslim says, you know, I've been told all my life, perfect preservation right down to the letter. I've been told all my life, scientific miracles. I've been told all my life, Islam has this pure, pure, simple theology. And now I'm hearing the teachings of my prophet from Christians who are completely destroying all of that. And you know, if my leaders told me wrong about all of that, the essential features of our religion, if they lied to me about all of that, what else were they lying to me about? And if these Christians are the only ones telling me the truth, I'd like to hear that. That was pretty cool. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, everybody. Don't shout me down, but uh, uh, Dr. Wood have two minutes to... Uh, I didn't need two minutes. I was on my last sentence just... before you interrupted me. I was on the last if, sentence. If I don't get it right, uh, Pastor George will never call me back again. So. Well, he's never calling you back again because you got it wrong. You got 120 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so anyway, th again, that, that, is, that is the pattern that you're looking for right there, right? Go to their leaders you get shut down. They go back to their leaders, you get shut down. You bring more information, they go back to their leaders, bring it back to you, you get shut down. Eventually, they find out there's some holes in the narrative. And then guess what? Who's been lying to them the entire time? My leaders. Who's been telling me the truth the entire time? These Christians. Well, if I want to start having some serious discussions about theology and religion and how I can know the true God who do I need to be listening to? If my religion were true, would it need to be built on a foundation of lies? And if, I, if these people who've been telling me nothing but lies also told me don't trust these Christians, and yet the Christians have been doing nothing but telling me the truth, maybe I've got all of this wrong here. Maybe I need to look into this for myself. And when that happens, you are talking to someone who is on his way out of Islam. All right. He's bigger up front than where you guys are sitting down at. <laughs> so next, we're going to uh, be talking about a topic of Islam, <clears throat> claims, facts, and problems. And we're going to have a panel discussion with Professor Jim Bayer, Dr. David Wood, and uh, Dr. Jay Smith, and also Al Fadi. And he's going to be joining online. He's going to be joining the leave through the screen. Unacceptable. <laughs> Unacceptable. Uh, let's make it seven minutes. We can take a seven minute recess.
Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? I'm speaking. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? All right. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. <clears throat> I hope you guys enjoyed your seven minute break. Um, <clears throat> just wanted to let you guys know that M2M, our main mission is to present the gospel to Muslims. So um, <clears throat> we're going to be passing around a basket. And, you know, if you would like to just give a small donation to help us fight the cause, which is give the gospel to Muslims, or if you would like to partner with us, feel free to do so. Um, you know, you're not handicapped in doing so, you know, you can help partner with us in, in that. <clears throat> and then um, I believe that everyone was passed a few booklets and, uh, you know, uh, cards. There's uh, one of the cards there, you could just fill it out. And there we will be able to email you guys events that will be happening in the near future. So <clears throat> with further ado, this is Professor um, <clears throat> Jim Bayer, and he will be taking it away. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right, we can have uh, David and Jay. And I think um, technical folks, you can tell me if we're joined by Al Fadi. Give me a, a yay or nay. We are good. It's supposed to. Is he up there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's just No, I don't know. I told you. Check, check. I told you technology never works. <laughs> the more sophisticated you try to get, the more things go wrong. Check, check. Hey, that's cool. All right, looks like we got him. We got him behind us. Here we go. All right, so we're also joined by Al Fadi, a former Muslim who is currently uh, working on a PhD in the Quran, um, and particularly the Arabic Quran. Turn on. Turn on. Ah, okay. Well, we're going to start this. I'm going to ask a series of questions. You can, you, you, you've probably seen on the website. This is claims, facts, problems within Islam. And I've just kind of jotted down some notes. I'm going to ask our, our, our three panel members. Panel members, I'm going to try to keep the responses five minutes, six minutes tops. Um, when we start hitting that point, I'll just kind of ask you to, to move on a little bit there so, so we can get a, a few questions. And some of these problems and facts and some of them one one person's fact can be another person's problem as, as you're going to see here as I, I just want to 
ask some of the questions. So Jay, I want to ask you the first one here. I mean, we've already talked about the Quran a little bit here. And, and one of the claims of Islam, a lot of us hear is, the Quran, well, that's a very easy book to read. I just pick it up and read it like those books you opened up with, right? It's got a nice flowing narrative. Um, talk about that. Is the Quran an easy book to read? Well, no, absolutely not. Uh, I don't know who told you that. I think, I think they were pulling your leg or they just hadn't opened the Quran themselves. Uh, if you look at the Quran, and we've all had that, and we've all looked at the Quran, it's just, it's ulta pulta, as we say in Hindi which means it's all over the place, and it, it doesn't flow. It's nothing like my Bible. The Bible is a book, easy book to read, because at least you have stories that begin and end, and you have one story that follows another. Show me any story that begins and ends in the Quran, and you'll only find one. There's only one story in the entire Quran that is complete, has a beginning, has an end, and that's Surah 12, the story of Joseph. Other than that, it jumps all over the place. It, it, it begins in the middle of the story. It ends before it's ended. It assumes the reader knows an awful lot about the Quran, so it's, it, it, it brings you and it slaps you into stuff that doesn't make sense from what comes right after it. More than that, it's full of contradictions. We've counted about 220 that we have found. It has historical anachronisms. I mean, David just talked about dual Karnain. It, it gets the crosses wrong. It, it has Moses, the time of Moses, a pharaoh sending a guy to get up on a cross, also at the time and Moses was living in 1400 BC. It has the time of Joseph. Another pharaoh sends another character to be uh, killed on the cross. That's in 1800 BC. Listen, crosses were only invented in the 7th century BC. So, I mean, you can go through all kinds of these errors. But, but the biggest problem is they say you have to read it in Arabic. Now, I, listen, I've had two years of Arabic, and I would not want to read everything in Arabic. Can you imagine us having to read the Bible in Hebrew and Greek, all of us? And yet, we can read it in English, and it makes all the sense in the world. In fact, anybody, well, I shouldn't say anybody, almost everybody, 93% of the world's population can now read the Bible in their own tongue. Why in the world can the Quran only be read in one language? Which suggests to me that that language is God's holy language. If that is the case, then which Arabic are you talking about? Because the Quranic Arabic that is in the Quran doesn't even come from Arabia. There is no Arabic that has the Tar Marbuto or the Aleph Maksura or the Aleph from Central Arabia in the 7th century. That is all Nabataean Aramaic, which comes 600 miles further north. So what Arabic did they use in the central part of Arabia in the 7th century? And the answer is Sabaic Arabic, which is rather ironic because Sabaic Arabic has dots and vowels. Ooh, doo -doo -doo. Isn't the dots and the vowels what's caused all this problem this year? Isn't those five dots and the, two, and the three vowels that... They had to introduce into this Nabataean Aramaic that existed in the 7th century up in what we now know as Jordan in Petra. Isn't that fascinating? That finally they had to create these dots and vowels, these five dots and the two vowels, where in the 8th century they suddenly came up with a whole panoply of different Qurans. So you're saying it's an easy Quran to read? Which Quran are you looking at? The 7th century Quran or the 8th century Quran? Or don't stop there. Why don't we go all the way up to the 10th century? Because these 30 different Qurans that have 30 different names on them Go all the way up until 905. That's the 10th century. But we're only chosen, all 30 of them were chosen in, here we go, 1429. That's the 15th century. That's 800 years after Muhammad. So which Quran are you talking about? 30 Qurans. But that's not all. They were chosen out of 700 Qurans. And not one of them were the same. Thank God I don't have that problem with the Bible. Come on home. What a book we've got. Bigger, better, and also more readable. I'd like to share yeah. an anecdote, yeah. an anecdote on that. Um, you guys remember, well, one of the most prominent atheists of the 20th century uh, was named Anthony Flew. He's a British, British philosopher. Um, so there was, uh, about almost 20 years ago, there was a big media thing because he'd become a theist. He said, now, now I believe in God. Um, but there's this awesome interview um, in, I think it was in Philosophia Christi, where Anthony Flew is asked if, he's ever, if he ever thinks he might convert to a specific religion like Christianity or Islam. He said he didn't think he will. And then he was asked you know, to compare them. And he said, okay, I can, I can make three comparisons between Christianity and Islam. And this is a guy who's spent his entire career attacking Christianity, right? So he said, uh, one, Paul was a brilliant scholar. Muhammad wasn't. Uh, two, Jesus is an incredibly charismatic figure. Muhammad most certainly was not. 
And he said, the Bible, whatever your philosophical position, the Bible is an amazing work of literature that everyone should learn. To read the Quran is to do penance. <laughs> for, the, for those of you who don't know, penance is where you punish yourself for your sins, right? And I just wanted to bring that up because that's my view of the Quran. That is the worst book I've ever read. I would literally rather read a phone book than read the Quran. I have to force myself to read the Quran, though. And I'm not saying that because I disagree with it and I criticize it. I disagree with, you know, David Hume, the, the Scottish skeptic. His dialogues concerning natural religion is a brilliant and brilliantly written book. I disagree with Plato on most things. Almost any book of Plato you could pick up and is brilliantly, brilliantly written. And uh, so the Quran, my goodness, and in addition to all the, the problems that Jay mentioned, there's also this problem that Allah can just never say what he means, right? He wants to say, if your wife gets out of line, tap her gently with a toothbrush, but it comes out, banish her to beds apart and beat her, right? He wants to say, get along with everyone, it comes out, fight those who do not believe, right? Testing, uh, can you hear me? Problem. And, and testing, notice, testing. It's early revelations where he could say what he actually meant. And the later revelations where he's commanding you to go out and fight and subjugate everyone, that's when he doesn't mean anything he says. So Allah sort of lost his ability to communicate clearly as time went on. Can you hear me? Meds or something like this, but he ended up with this kind of cosmic Tourette syndrome where he just keeps blurting out all these horrible, violent things that he doesn't actually mean. And we're told this is the best, most beautiful, perfect book in history. And it's a one, two, three, testing, testing. Away. Testing, one, two, three, testing. So, Al Fadi, want to ask you, it's gone? Okay. Okay. Imagine that, a technical problem. <laughs> I must be a prophet. All right. David, I don't know how to claim. This is a claim. I think it's a problem. We hear from Muslims a lot as Christians. Oh, you want to understand this? You've already mentioned the Hadith. I want to kind of expand on that, right? When so when a Muslim okay. comes and says, oh, all my beliefs. Can you guys hear me now? Oh, Testing, Quran. one, two, three. Can you hear me? Is that true? No, I don't even know what you're talking about. Are you able to hear me at all? The most basic practices of Islam come from the Hadith. They might be mentioned or something oh. like that. There might be some part of them that, that's in the Quran. Um, but to take the Shahada. You ask any Muslim, how do you become? How about now, right now? Can you hear me? Now the phone is on. There is a kind of Shahada in the Quran, but that's it's not the full Shahada. Are you able to hear okay? You testify that um, there's no God but Allah and that Muhammad is his messenger. That comes from the Hadith. Uh, how many times do you pray per day as a Muslim? Ask a Muslim. You pray five times a day. Oh, show me that in the Quran. The Quran mentions three daily prayers. The five, the five prayers a day, that comes from the Hadith. Um, so over and over and over. I mean, you, you know, you can find things, again, mentioned in the Quran saying that you should pray, but the details come from the Hadith. You can, you know, uh, find various teachings about things you're supposed to do, like the Hajj and so on. But as far as what you're supposed to do, that comes from the Hadith. And so uh, the reason this is such a problem is, uh, and, and I'm guessing the reason this is brought up is, when we start bringing all of this material from the Hadith to Muslims about Muhammad having sex with a nine-year-old girl and so on, bring out all these things. Muslims, ah, no, I only believe in the Quran. Well, if you only believe in the Quran, you're regarded as a heretic in Islam. And there are reasons for that. So for instance, Surah 4, verse 65 of the Quran says that in order to submit to Allah, Muslims have to obey every decision of Muhammad. Well, the Quran doesn't contain Muhammad's decisions. The Hadith, the hadith is where you find Muhammad's decisions. So you can't even obey the Quran without going to the Hadith. The Quran says in Surah 33, verse 21, that Muhammad is the pattern of conduct for Muslims. How are you going to know what Muhammad's pattern of conduct was unless you go and read about his life in the Hadith? And so there's all these kinds of problems. And notice this position that Muslims are getting stuck in. It's, hey, I don't want to hear all this stuff you guys are saying about my prophet, so I'm going to pretend like I'm a Quran-only Muslim. You know, Quran-only Muslims are regarded as, as heretics by Orthodox Islam because they have to throw out everything that that the Muslim sources teach about Muhammad and they have to teach, they have to throw out some of their most basic practices. And so, great, accept this information about Muhammad or your religion crumbles. Take your pick, either one, we're good. How about when they say, you start throwing out the Hadith and they go, well, you know, there are Hadiths that are, they're just not reliable. Well, well, that's true. And, and I mean, you know, you can make the case. You could, you could, you've got one extreme that the Hadith are just completely unreliable. And, um, 
you know, th then there's then there's a spectrum. But yeah, so a, a Muslim can say that particular hadith is it doesn't it doesn't meet our criteria that our Muslim scholars have come up with. And you could, of course, argue it if you want. You could defend it based on you know the principles of, of history and so on. Um, but you can just say, okay, you can go to other hadiths that are that are classed as Sahih narrations. They're classed as as right. strong what, what, as, sahih, as strong narrations. Sahih. I mean, strong. Yeah. So so you have this, you know, you have strong and then good and then and then weak and so on. And then they have some other minor classifications as as well. But I, I want to say this though. Generally, when a Muslim says weak hadith, he, he has no idea the grade. He's just I don't like that hadith, and so I'm calling it weak, hoping that you won't know enough to go look it up. Um, but the it, basically, you're, you're, you're generally pretty good to go if you're quoting Sahih al-Bukhari or Sahih Muslim. And as far as their other main collections, so Sunan Abu Dawa, Jamia Termidi, um, Sunan An-Nasai, Sunan Ibn Majah, in the uh, English translations put out by Darul Salam, they come with the grade right there. So you can, you, you, you can always, if, you, if, if someone says weak hadith and you're thinking that doesn't sound right, then what you say is, uh, show me the Hadith scholar who classed that as weak so I can know that you know what you're talking about. And that's, why, that's when you find out if it's someone who's just making it up or, or if they're, they actually know Hadith criticism and so on. Right, which they usually don't. And I, I like that you mentioned the Dar al Salam Hadith because of the Sahih Bukhari and the, and the Sahih Muslim, there are no classifications of any Hadith in those books because they're all reliable. And... Um, they class them in the other Hadith sets, but not those two. And uh, so that they just de facto told me everything there was reliable, according to the title of the book. Okay, problem. Oh, we have Al Fadi. Good. Uh, Al Fadi, I want to ask you a question about um, this could be a problem, I, we could say, uh, within Islam. And that is, as, we, as, as Christians are witnessing to Muslims, and there are Muslims, as evidence here tonight, who convert to Christianity. Can you talk to us about some of the problems that there, let, let's just say in a Western nation, because it's going to be completely different in the Middle Eastern nation. In a Western nation, what kind of problems are these converts to Christianity going to face? Well, thank you for the question. Can everyone hear me okay? I told you. Better get that right now before the debate with Shabir tomorrow. Yeah. Al Fadi, your mic is horrible. Well, they, they asked me to wear this. I'm going to buy you a new mic. So uh, I, I want to continue talking, but I don't know if it's going to give that problem. Looking back there like he can see me. <laughs> so they're asking me to get closer. Can everybody hear me now? Let the technical guys work on this. We'll go on to the next one. Jay? By, by the way, in defense of the tech guys, all of this is nightmarishly difficult. Um, I, I've known studios that, that had trouble getting, a, getting the sound connected to the, you know, the, the live feed and stuff like that. And it was just, uh, and you give them three hours and they, they still couldn't get it. So this stuff does get, does get really tricky. So, but I'm still going to make fun of everyone anyway. <laughs> all right, so Jay. Under the topic of problems in Islam, is Muhammad a problem for Islam? What would you say? You can hit some big ones for yeah, our I'm, I'm not going to answer that one until tomorrow yeah. night. Okay. He's a huge problem for Islam. He's a huge problem for David. But oh, hold he, on until tomorrow. Muhammad's a problem. Muhammad's a problem, but not in the way Jay thinks. Are you ready? Well, let's, tomorrow night we're going to destroy that comment right there. Oh. <laughs> Something's going to get destroyed tomorrow, but it won't be my comment. On to so, the next question. So talk to us about um, another, another a fact that's pre often presented to us as Christians is uh, Islam, the biggest religion in the world, fastest growing religion in the world, not only within Middle Eastern countries, Western countries. Um, what are you seeing? What are your thoughts, observations, um, yeah, converts? I and, and this, is, this is something that we need to pay attention to. And this is the reason why I'm, in the Islam, I'm working in the Islamic world, that very notion. Now, certainly I did grow up amongst Muslims all my life. So I've had Islam around me having, uh, I was born and grew up in India for the first 17 years. But it was at a conference, something like this, a conference that we're doing here back in 1981. 
where I heard the three, three numbers, three statistics. One, that there were 800 million Muslims. In 1981, there were only 800 million. How many are there today? It's approaching 2 billion. So it's doubled, over doubled in just the last, what is that, 38 years since I've been working in Islam. Please don't blame me for it. But can you see the problem? That was such a big number, I didn't even think of it. I didn't, I, it was too big a number to compute. It was the next two numbers that were told me that really bothered me, and that was that there were only 1,500 missionaries working amongst them, and that this 1,500 only made up 2% of all missionaries. When I heard those two numbers, that was like a slap in my face. And I said, you know, we're not paying attention to the growth of Islam. It is growing hugely, and it used to be something that was over there. It was not something here in America. It was something for the missionaries to worry about, and only a very small select few. And now suddenly Islam is very much here in America as well. It's all around you here, especially here in California. I don't know what the number is here. They're your neighbors. They're in your schools. Some of them are in your families. You cannot, you cannot walk away from Islam anymore, anywhere, anywhere or with anyone. And so that's why this idea of growth, it is growing. It will, I understand, it will surpass Christianity as the largest religion possibly in 50 years if it continues to grow at the pace that it is growing. And then we're talking about... Christianity, both Catholics and Protestants put together. But here, let's be careful about these numbers as well, because the growth that we're talking about is almost entirely biological growth. As I've said this all the time, when I was in Britain living there for 25 years, a, an average woman has 1.8 children. Don't ask me how she does, but she does. An average Muslim has 4.2 children. So they're double the national average. I don't know whether this is, it would be the same here in the United States, but certainly in Britain, it's a real problem. And we have, in the 25 years that I was there, where, whereas when I first got there, they were primarily mostly in London, and half the population of all the Muslims in Britain were just in one city, in London. Now they're all over Birmingham, they're in Bradford, they're in Leicester. In fact, we now have 10 cities that have Muslim mayors in Britain. 10 cities, including London, that have Muslim mayors. So it's very much a problem in Britain. It's not yet come to the States in the same way that it has in Europe. They are growing. They are having huge influence politically. They're having an enormous influence socially. Uh, we've seen how that they have now introduced Islamic law to British law as of 2009. We now have Islamic courts, legitimate Islamic courts, subsidized and also under the authority of British courts. When I left, there were about 80 to 100 Islamic courts all over Britain. I understand they want to get 200 in the next two years. So it is a real problem. It is a real problem. The growth that is there. But here, I want to end with a good note. That is biological growth. They just have bigger families. You were born a Muslim. You were not born a Christian. You have to choose Jesus Christ for yourself. When you look at conversion growth, when you look at conversion growth, according to the latest statistics, Islam grows Conversion-wise, 2.5%. Christianity has a 5% conversion growth. So we have doubled the conversion growth they do, which means people choose Christianity twice as much as they do Islam. Secondly, those who choose Islam, what we have found is that they only remain Muslims for about three years. And then they get disillusioned. And they get fed up. They don't necessarily come home, and that's where we need to work. And that's why the statistics are there. Be careful of the statistics, understand the statistics, and then praise God, because when, it, when you have Islam and Christianity next to each other, when you have them side by side, Christianity always wins. And this is why it's so important that we have conferences like this, because this conference is mostly introducing into apologetics and polemics going on the offense and also defending. And that is not being done enough with Islam. We need many more. We need to reproduce all of you. You need to have 100 Davids. You need to have 200 Sams. We need to reproduce you guys. You guys are young. <laughs> he just liked that because I doubled him over you. And I just said because you have to have 200 to equal 100 That's Davids. That's true. That's there true. you go. Get it right, Sam. I'm sorry. I prefer David. But can you see what I'm saying? We need to be producing many more people like this. We need to be producing younger ones. I got gray hair. I'm the, probably the only one in my generation that's doing what I do. But there's a whole new generation coming up. And we have YouTube. And we have lots of vehicles. And we have an enormous amount of material, especially 2020. Wait till you see what we have to offer you tomorrow in 2020. This year has been a 
uh, landmark year, probably more so of, uh, we have had learned more material this year than probably any other year that I know of the last 38 years that I've been working. So be encouraged. Uh, I wanted to add one, one, one comment on the, uh, on the, the growth of Islam, because it, it's another situation where Muslim leaders give their guide this argument to go out and share. And, and it's just, it seems like when every other argument fails, then they come back with, but Islam's the fastest growing religion. This somehow shows it's true. Which, so the rate of growth of something shows that it's true. I guess coronavirus is the truest thing ever. Anyway, um, the, the, this, the, this, the same study that said that Islam was the fastest growing religion said, because uh, you, you wondered if it was true in, in, in other areas. But yeah, it said everywhere they have data on, Islam has the highest birth rates. Muslims have the highest, uh, the highest birth rates. And that, but that same study also said it's, bio, it's biological, right? It's, it's due to birth rates. And here's what's interesting. You've got this argument that Muslims are encouraged to use. Islam is the true religion. It's the fastest growing religion. Notice, we said we're the biggest religion. Does that mean it's true? No, nah, it has nothing to do with whether it's true. Um, and if something tomorrow became the fast, if Mormonism became the fastest growing religion tomorrow, you ask the Muslims, does that mean that Mormonism is true? That has nothing to do with it's true. What about when Islam is the fastest? Yes, that proves that it's true. And so you have this kind of shifting uh, criteria of what, what makes a religion true. Uh, but here's what's interesting. Um, Muslims really seem to think when they're out saying Islam is the fastest growing religion, they seem to think that it's based on conversions. That's what they think. It's everyone's converting to it because they know it's true. When, as Jay pointed out, it's, it's, it's birth rates. But here's what's interesting. If you start investigating why Islam has the highest birth rates and you start going country by country, you start finding out it has a lot to do with Islam's impact on women where, in, I mean, it varies from place to place, but in lots of places, women are not encouraged to get an education, to go out and get a career. Women, uh, girls are married off at a young age. And so basically, you know, you take a, a, a you know, place like America where, you know, a girl goes through school, some of them go off to college, some of them start their career, and by maybe 25 or 28 or something like that, they start thinking about having their first kid. Whereas, um, you know, a girl who is married off at 12 or 13 in Afghanistan is on kid six or seven by then. That's why Islam is the fastest growing religion according to birth rates, the impact it has on women, turning them into baby making machines who have nothing else to do in life except start reproducing. And so if Muslims wanted to state the argument accurately in its fullness, they wouldn't say Islam's the fastest growing religion, so it must be true. It would have to be Islam has such a horrible impact on women and gives them so few opportunities that they have nothing to do apart from making babies. And because of that, it has the highest birth rates and so it's growing rapidly and it must be true. And that would be a very strange argument. I think I'd like to debate that one. All right, so speaking of debates, if Islam is so true, I imagine that you have Zakir Naik and a host of others just knocking on your door, wanting to debate you and just absolutely ruin you. But we don't see that happen, do we? I mean, I don't here in this ministry. We have a heck of a time getting Muslims to debate. Why? Is, is there any debater in this room who has not challenged Zucker Knight to debate? Everyone has. I mean, it, it, it's just funny because, you know, Zucker Knight, he debated, he debated basically two guys years ago. Um, one was actually um, William Campbell, so actually a great Christian apologist, not a great speaker, orator, or something like that. Um, had awesome arguments, but not, not a very skilled. Hmm? No, that was Zachary Knight. He debated William Campbell. Yeah, where you been? I keep, I keep having to teach this guy stuff. But um, yeah, so Zachary Knight debated, Zachary Knight debated William Campbell, and he debated some pastor that I'd never heard of, right? And he may have debated some Indian, but years ago, when I was starting, to, when I was getting started, I said, oh, Zakir Naik is the guy that Muslims are all claiming is the, the greatest debater. And I saw on eBay the Zakir Naik debate collection. So like, cool, I'll get that. So it was all these DVDs, and I got them. And there were two debates and a bunch of lectures. And so it was those two debates. So I've never seen him debate. I assume he's debated some you know, Hindu or something like that. On, but notice, a guy debated two Christians a couple decades ago. He picked those debates because he knew that, in the case of Campbell, he could over, overpower him with rhetoric. and pick picked the other guy because he knew that guy knew nothing about Islam. And so think about this. Muslims recognize him as their champion debater because he did such a great job. 
Well, in the meantime, every you know, Christian apologist and debater for the past decade and a half has been challenging Zachary Nike. Hey, why don't, you why don't you face one actual Christian debater in your career if you're going to be named the, the champion debater? And he won't go near that. Nope, says, nope, you're beneath me. You're not good enough to face, to face me. Well, how do we know? You haven't faced one actual debater in your entire career. But, but think about how brilliant this is, right? Because your average Muslim in, in let's say, India, he doesn't know the difference between William Campbell and Sam Shamoon. They don't know the difference. So, ah, we took down your champion, right? And notice that would, we could do that. Right? We, we could do the same thing. We could find someone who just you know, isn't very skilled debater or doesn't know anything about Christianity and run circles around them and then go around proclaiming ourselves as the, as the truth. But no, I, I mean, I don't know a Christian debater who deals with Islam who's not challenged, uh, Zakhar Naik and a bunch of others, uh, but all have been turned down. Okay. We heard earlier from our sister when she was giving her testimony, and um, this is, you know, something that I've, I've been thinking of, some of us we've been challenged by. You know, Islam will say Christianity is so confusing. You've got the Presbyterians and the Baptists, and you got this and you got that, and you all just don't get along, and you're all so different. Just absolute, a bundle of confusion. So, of course, they don't have any sex within Islam. Do they? They don't have sex in Islam. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> so talk to us about the variety of Muslims we may run into. I don't even how to handle that argument. Yeah, I, th I think that this is, this is a fascinating one. They only talk about the two sects, just so I don't get tongue-tied on that. <laughs> they only have the Shiites and the Sunnis. And you can, you can see that uh, you can ask many Muslims this very question. And they will stop and think, and they'll say, oh, yeah, that's right. You, if, you, uh, if you even just you go one mosque from another, you'll find that they have many, many different sects. Uh, we have in Britain, we have the Deobandis and the Barelis, and you have every, almost every mosque has a different, not only language section, but they also have a different category of you know, one of the brotherhoods. You have the Tijaniyas and the Kadarniyas and the in Senegal, we used to come across the Morids, and it was just fascinating, the many, many different groups. They don't like to bring that out in the public because that's dirty linen. And I think it's fascinating because when you do it and you ask some, what are these sects, uh, or what are they beliefs are, and when you ask them what they actually come out, when you unpack what they're saying, many of them are theologically miles apart. And it's not just incidental material. It's nothing to do with the Quran or, the, or Muhammad. It comes down to salvation. It comes to their definition of sin. It comes down to even what heaven's going to look like, who's going to be there. It's fascinating when you start unpacking them. And, the, and, the, and when you start asking, well, aren't these actually contradictory? Many of their theologies completely contradictory. They kind of look blankly at you, and they say, well, that's the first time we've ever thought about it. When you look at Christianity, and, of course, they always go on, the different, you know, the different Protestant sects uh, or the different categories that we have in Protestantism. We almost all believe on the same thing. We, it's certain ways of practice is about the only thing you differ, differentiate on. And so what I always do with Muslims, whenever this comes up, I always say, I always use uh, the, the circle argument, that the, the circle are these absolutes that all Christians believe. These are the categories that every Christian believes. These are the absolutes that we don't go beyond. The fact that Jesus died on the cross, rose again, and it's through that death and resurrection that we get salvation. But inside that, there are many different small tertiary practices that we differ on. And that's usually where denominations are created, and that's why we do have these different groups. But that, those absolutes be, uh, that we all agree on, everybody, whether they are Presbyterians or Methodists, or I, I have to be careful because maybe there's some, there are some people that would disagree with me on this, but almost all the denominations, even the Catholics, and God bless them, we, we work with the Catholics in Britain all the time because of the fact that we do believe in the person of Jesus Christ. It's when you start unpacking this with Muslims and you start looking and seeing where the Sufis are and then where the Brotherhoods are and where the Deobandis are, converted the Barelis are, and all these other groups that are now popping up all over the Middle East, and when you start asking some of their category beliefs, they are off the wall, absolutely contradictory. And then Muslims start to realize there is no really one cohesive Islam. There's such a variety of different Islams. I, Muslims will come to me and they say, yeah, there are 72 different ones. That comes from one of the traditions. But I, 
I, it's the centrality of the person of Jesus Christ that I always like to always end with. I always come back and I say, that's the one thing that we all agree on. And it's the one thing that separates us from you as Muslims. It all comes down to Jesus Christ. And I don't know of any Christian in this room where we come, we probably represent many different denominations, but we all believe on who Jesus was, what he did, what he stands for, and what he's done for us. So, David, I've had Muslims tell me before, as I've been out witnessing to them, uh, one of their claims is Islam is such a great religion because it just respects women. And often when I see that, I'm, I'm like some of you. I, I kind of want to laugh inside and I go, is this person, are they really serious? Or, do they really, or are they lying to me? And they know they're lying to me. I, okay, you know, I, I, of course, I don't entertain that, but I'll answer it. But it's a claim of Islam. I mean, I hear it all the time. We don't let our women dress like, and then they'll throw some word I won't say out here right now, but respect for women and Islam is one of their claims. Did you make a list of, like, total softball questions? Well, no. Of course they respect women. You already said they have no sex. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, no you, you, can, you can certainly find, you can find individual Muslims who respect uh, women. But, I mean, as far as the religion is concerned, I'm sure you had some, some pagan religions at times that may have had worse practices and so on, but I can't think of too much that's uh, worse than Islam. That, by the way, that's not, that's not just my opinion. Aisha. Muhammad's child bride, mother of the faithful, that's her title in Islam, mother of the faithful, daughter of Muhammad's best friend and the first of the rightly guided caliphs, Abu Bakr. Uh, she was once approached by a woman whose skin had been turned green by her husband beating her. Woman came to Aisha, hey, look at what my husband's doing to me. Aisha said, no worry, we'll go to Muhammad about this. Aisha walks into Muhammad and says, I have not seen any woman suffering as much as the believing women. Her skin is greener than her clothes. The woman was wearing a, a green dress. And long story short, I have a video on this, but long story short, Muhammad ended up condemning the woman for being a bad wife. So she, she, she deserved being beaten until her skin turned green because she was, not very, she was not as respectful as she should have been to her husband. So this is... The mother of the faithful saying, Muslim women are treated worse than pagan women. And I've seen this with my own eyes. And here's exhibit A right here, this woman with green skin. And Muhammad condemns the woman. So, I mean, think about that. Because you'll have people today, oh, Islam respects women. Well, according to the woman who learned what Islam does, the impact it has on women who learned it, when it was being revealed from Muhammad himself, Muslim women had it worse than pagan women. And you can go through and see why. With the, the wife beating and raping your female captives, and uh, you can hire prostitutes in Islam, you can do all kinds of things. Um, but you know, child marriage, not just from the pattern of Muhammad, but because it's, it's laid down in the Quran that you can marry, have sex with, and then divorce a girl all before she has reached the age of puberty. Um, horrible, horrible, horrible things. And I can't imagine anything in the world today having a worse impact on women than Islam. In fact, there are statistics to back that up. Every organization um, that, is, that has done a, a global study on um, women in various countries in terms of the rights they have, uh, the rate of child marriage, um, whether how far they get in their education or careers and so on. Whatever study you go to, you'll find 11 of the 12 worst places in the world to be a woman are Muslim-majority countries. 18 out of 20 of the worst places in the world to be a woman are Muslim-majority countries. And so you've got the teachings. You can read them off a page. If someone says, oh, no, you're misinterpreting all of those, well, it seems like a lot of people are misinterpreting them in exactly the same way I am uh, because that's the impact we've seen all around the world. Jay, I want to, if you could compare and contrast two things for me. A, a Muslim who, whether converted or is, is born into a Middle Eastern family here in, in a Western nation, 
Great Britain, America, Australia, et cetera. And, and, and a Muslim that you and I might run into in a Middle Eastern country. So I'm asking, is a Muslim born and raised in a Western country different from a Muslim who is going to come from a Middle Eastern country? And if so, how? Yeah, I, I, you know, I hear what you're saying. I, the new one. I, I think what, you, what you're going to find, just from my own experience, those who come from a Middle Eastern country, do not have the freedoms, a lot of the freedoms that they have in the West. And so they're going to not be, they're not going to be as objective, objective in their analysis. We saw this at Speaker's Corner. Um, almost every Sunday that we were there, we, we ha we'd have hordes of Muslims coming in from many, many different uh, countries. And we could pretty much delineate within the first two minutes who we're talking to. We didn't even have to ask them. Sometimes you could look at them and see where they came from, but you could tell just by the, the, the type of logic they had, the type of categories they would use, whether or not they had been brought up in a non-Western country. And it was fascinating to me. The only ones that I had a difficulty with were, were from the Indian subcontinent. The ones from the Indian subcontinent, they, by virtue of the fact that they grew up in an educational system that spoke English, they were light years ahead of everybody, all the rest of the world, the Islamic world. But what was fascinating, if you were talking to somebody from the Arab world, a Muslim from the Arab world, you knew you were going to go around in circles. It was what we call the cyclical form of argumentation. Let me give a prime example. What and how is it that Muhammad is authoritative? Well, because the Quran says so. Okay, and so where does the Quran get its authority? From Muhammad. Okay, so where does Muhammad get it from the Quran? And it just kind of goes in this cyclical type of, you, they can't step outside of that. They've never really thought through that there is a problem with that argument. You talk to somebody who's from Turkey, and you pretty much have to define what they are there to believe before you can even talk to them because they know diddly swat about their own religion. They just know they're Muslims. You talk to somebody from North Africa, all these French speakers, and you pretty well know that you're going to get into a political discussion, nothing theological. In fact, notice, Libby, you'll never get into a theological discussion with Arabs or anybody from the Middle East. You'll never get into a theological discussion with anybody from the North Africa. The theological discussions were almost, almost uniquely Pakistanis, Indians, and Bangladeshis. And I was, having grown up in that part of the world, for me, it just was matter of fact that I said, you know, what has happened to the rest of the Muslim world? How come they aren't able to even take on or haven't they are able to take on any of these categories? And stop and think through, who are the best debaters in the Muslim world today? Are any of them from the Arab-speaking world? Can you name me one? Dr. Jamal Badawi, that's it. But he did all his work in English there in Halifax in Canada. All the other best debaters, the best debaters, Zakir Naik, Bombay, Ahmadidak, yes, he is what did his work in South Africa, but he's from Gujarat. Shabir Ali comes from Indian background. Anand Rashid, Pakistan, Mansur Ahmad, Bangladesh. These guys and gals, they all come from the Indian subcontinent and they all speak eloquent English and they all are able to confront us theologically, and that's why when you stop and look at them, they are all attacking Christianity. They're always attacking Christianity. When I first went in 1992 down to Speaker's Corner, and I looked at all the 10 different groups that I was there, and there was Arabs there, but the ones that were on the ladder were always Asians, and the ones who were on the ladder, they were always attacking Christianity, the person of Jesus Christ, his divinity, the Trinity, and I couldn't understand why they were, had such an interest in Christianity, but when I talked to the Arabs and all the others, they just want to talk politics. They just wanted to talk, especially the North Africans, they were, had no, nothing good to say about France. And I'm not there to talk about France, or the others all wanted to talk about Israel and the Palestinian issue. Nobody wanted to talk about the Trinity except all of the Indian subcontinent. And stop and think, they are the ones that dominate the world. The vast majority of Muslims come from three countries, Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh. You're almost, if you just add up their Muslim populations, you get almost 600 million right there. And they all speak English, folks. No wonder so much of the internet is now garnered against Christianity. Because the best debaters, the best thinkers who are actually in, who are doing it in the English language are all from that part of the world. Which means we're going to have to retool our apologetics and our polemics. And we're going to have to take on that world because it is so dominant. But God bless them. Did you notice everything they want to talk about are two things. Jesus and the Bible. What two things would you rather talk about than those two? I don't even know if that was answering your question, but it's, at least it was what I wanted to talk about. I don't about. even remember the question. 
All right, David, you mentioned uh, earlier when, you know, we talked about the Quran obviously is not the only source of Islam. You got the Hadith, you talked about the Hadith. Also in your presentation, you mentioned another book. I want you to talk to the people here about in terms of its authority. And that is the, um, the biography of Muhammad. And should we read it? Is it authoritative? Talk to us about that. I think Jay mentioned, uh, I think Jay right. mentioned, uh, yeah, Ibn, Ibn Asad. He did, he did. But I, I can't even talk right now because Jay is going to be, <laughs> that never happened. But, um, um, I mean, he's, it's. He's already intimidated. Listen to him. Yeah, I'm super scared. Oh, Muhammad never existed. Oh, the man in the book, man in the book. Come on home, David. Come on home. Oh, <laughs> oh, do, 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 do. <laughs> Uh, did you see people's buttons? The who, two, 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 two? Yeah, they had who and then two, two, two. And that was you. Uh, but then some people started wearing TikTok time to rock, so that was cool. That was... Oh, Ibn Asak? Yeah. Should, 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 should people read it? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, I mean, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're trying to study if you're trying to study Muhammad, I mean, if, if you're trying to study it academically, you have to read sources like that. As far as, as far as whether Christians who are interested in evangelism and apologetics and polemics and so on are concerned, it kind of depends on how deep you want to go. Because, I mean, when people say, hey, should I read the Quran? Um, even there, I don't say, I don't just jump on it. Yes, go out and read the Quran, because I know lots of people who start reading the Quran and then they give up after, after two chapters because it's, it's too much of a nightmare. So as far as if you're, if you're trying to start out studying Islam and Muhammad and so on, um, I normally suggest studying topically, right? Like pick a topic that you're interested in. And so if you're interested in Muslim objections to the crucifixion of Jesus or Muslim objections to uh, the deity of Christ or the Trinity or something like that, find an article like on answering Islam or, or in a book or something like that and go study that issue. So go find the, um, the Quran verses and, you know, various hadiths and passages in the Sira that deal with that issue. Learn that topic well. And so you've got, you know what the Muslim sources say about that. And then pick another topic. And then once you've gone through the main topics you're interested in, once you realize you you read some major sections of the Quran and, and going, then read, then read through the Quran. But as far as you know, just sitting down and reading Ibn Asak or something like that, that's a pretty big, that's a pretty big book. So I would use Ibn Asak as a resource if you're looking up particular incidents. Um, but if you're just gonna read an entire biography of Muhammad, that would be kind of you know a few years into a few years into your into your studies. All right, so Ibn Asak is one big book. The Hadith would be, we talked about the Hadith, would be how many the, the, volumes? Yeah, these are, these are massive multi-volume collections. So yeah. Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, nine volumes in English, uh, in English translation. Um, Sahih Muslim, seven volumes. Um, the, the other major collections range from, from five to six volumes. And those are just the six main collections. And you have a lot more collections and so, you know, on the one hand, that can be intimidating because you think, oh, look at all that stuff I would have to learn. There's no way I could learn that. Therefore, I'll, I'll go deal with Jehovah's Witnesses or something like that. Um, but no, they're, they're, very, they're very repetitive. If you just learn some of the main hadiths on a lot of the issues, I mean, I keep trying to get, because I see, I've seen so many Christians get discouraged when they, they look at this and they're like, look at all this stuff and all these different Muslims, and they're going to have all these objections and I won't know what to say. Bull. Muslims are going to bring the same five or six objections over and over and over and over and over again. So if you learn those, you're good to go. Um, and as far as their arguments from Islam, for, us, for Islam, they only have a few of those, and they're, they're, they're starting to see some holes in the narrative. So it, this, is, this, is, this is not as difficult as, as you think. All right. Gentlemen, I want to thank you for this. This ends our panel. Now, um, some of our questions were short. You will have a chance to talk to our panel members tomorrow. Uh, in the afternoon during a break. So let me turn it back over to the moderator. Mr. moderator. Can I just say one thing? Um, we've been talking a lot about Sam and David. When another person we really need to mention is Anthony Rogers. He, I just saw him come in the door. We need to really make sure that you also pick his mind. The guy's amazing. And uh, it's this new generation of young guys. There's Anthony. Just give him a hand as he comes in. Uh, hey, hey, hey. 
Hey, Sam, 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 Sam Shimon, can you think of anyone with the possible exception of Rob Bowman? I think they may be t- anyone more underrated than, than Anthony as far as someone who has massive amounts of knowledge and yet. And so, so Anthony, tomorrow's your chance to sort of show yourself and your skills. Oh, where's Edwards? Is he here too? The gripper? Where's the gripper? All right, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, once again, we're going to <clears throat> we're going to pass around um, an offering basket. Again, this is your chance. If you like, if the Lord puts it in your heart, if you would like to, um, <clears throat> if you like to partner up with us or you'd like to give a one-time offering, please do so. We're going to have uh, the baskets being passed around. Who's passing around the, the baskets? Please, we got one, two. Okay, awesome. So um, during that time, <clears throat> while they're passing uh, the basket around, let's please close our eyes, go before the Lord, and we're going to pray out. Heavenly Father, we thank you for everything that was uh, spoken here today. We ask that your words will be held captive into our hearts, that you would give us the desire, the, um, <clears throat> the memory for us to, um, for us to, to learn everything that was or part of the things that were spoken here today so we could use it as a gospel tool to evangelize to Muslims. Uh, Father, we thank you for all that we have, and uh, we thank you that we, it would be pleasing to you that we'll be here tomorrow and on Sunday. Again, anoint the lips and the tongues of every single speaker who will be speaking here uh, for the remaining of this conference. We ask this in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'd like to call up Pastor George Saeed, and he has some words before um, I let you go. Just close with some announcements for you. days and I just would like to draw your attention to the bulletin we have our ministry ministry to Muslims um, I'm sorry I, I forgot that I, 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 and, uh, 
uh, it's not clear. Um, ministry to Muslims, uh, we have weekly prayer meeting every Thursday night. We pray over the phone for the salvation of Muslims as the next day we go to the mosques and share the gospel with them. Uh, if you are able to join us in that on Thursday night, uh, let us know. Uh, we can give you the information how you join. But one thing you can do, please set up your phone, your cell phone alarm at one o'clock on Fridays. When that alarm goes off, Remember that we are standing outside these mosques and we're sharing the gospel with Muslims and we need your prayers. Without prayers, we cannot do anything. We can present the gospel, but the only one can open their hearts is the work of the Holy Spirit, is the, uh, Jesus, that he will draw them to himself. He will reveal himself to them in dreams and visions. Amen? Uh, but also we have uh, different teams. If you would like to join us at the mosque, if uh, you are not in Southern California or somewhere else and you would like to start a team, we will be more than happy to help you to start your own ministry to reach out to the Muslim community in your area. Uh, also, every uh, Sunday we have uh, uh, volunteering hours. If you would like to come and volunteer, let us know. But also at 5 o'clock every single uh, Sunday night we have uh, speakers like Dr. J. Smith. He usually every third Sunday of the month. We have Dr. Daniel Scott or Professor Daniel Scott from Australia. He joined us uh, twice a month. So we have Samuel Green from Australia. He's awesome brother. He also joined us once a month. And uh, Anthony Rogers, Eddie Delcor. Uh, every week we have different speakers scheduled for you uh, in a smaller setting where you can regularly interrupt and ask questions and uh, uh, not just like a YouTube video you are watching, but you are able to interact with the speakers. It's, I really encourage you, if you want to reach out to Muslims, to join us on Sunday nights from 5 o'clock to around 7, 7, Seri every Sunday. Uh, but the, the second Sunday of the month, if you are in Southern California, you feel free to join us in Anaheim, uh, at Cabaret Chapel, Anaheim. We have a potluck, and then we have a guest speaker. But next month, uh, we have our appreciation dinner and Christmas uh, dinner. And we're going to have with us, uh, last year at this conference, I said the only former Muslim from Somalia I know is Sister Mariama, and she was with us last year. But praise God, Sister Mariama is going to be with us on Sunday. But I met new two friends of mine here. Uh, Muhammad, can you stand up? Muhammad and Hope uh, Nasra from Somalia. They are former Muslims. <laughs> She been in America since 1994. Not until when? Two years ago? She heard about Jesus Christ. All these years, no one shared the gospel with them. What about our Muslim neighbors? Our Muslims around us? So sit down. <laughs> thank, you, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's just awesome. Uh, I, I've been talking to them on the phone. This is my first day meeting them in person. It's just an, a hearing their testimony, their story. I'm going to interview them briefly on Sunday night, but on the second Sunday of next month, they're going to share their testimony in details, and I encourage you to join us for dinner. Uh, you don't have to bring anything. Just come and join us uh, at Cabri Chapel, Anaheim. Uh, if you need the address afterward, because there's three Cabri Chapels in Anaheim, make sure you ask me which one. Um, but it's going to be awesome time. We'd love to have you. That's the second Sunday of every month. We have I guess the speakers. We have a potluck time. Uh, now, we have also a, a, the Sikh Parade Outreach in October, Lord willing. Uh, last year, we have, there, is, there was uh, 150,000 Sikhs from India. They came from all over the world to Yuba City, California. It was only around 20 Christians in the midst of 150,000 people. These people are unreached people, and we need to reach out to them. And we have... Uh, uh, brother Jasper, he's a former Sikh. I call him the J. Smith of the Sikhs. <laughs> he's a wonderful brother. He's really, he knows their religion. He's a great apologist, and he taught us a lot about them, and we were able to go and reach out to these people. If you would like to join us next year, please let us know uh, to be able, uh, to, uh, it would be great to know ahead of time if you are coming, and th this way we organize a great team. Uh, but what an opportunity in this great country we must pray for the freedom we have because this freedom is coming in a place where it's very, very troubling what we see. But this freedom is so valuable. They understand this freedom. They lived in a country without a police, without government. And, that's, uh, and I lived in a country where we have no freedom in Sudan, North Africa. And it 
when I see what's happening, it's really troubling. And that's why we do need to lift our country in prayers. Please pray regularly for the situation happening now that the Lord will reveal truth and that people will get to see and understand what's happening. I don't know if Neda told you that when she shared her testimony earlier, Sister Neda, she's a lawyer. She's a Christian lawyer. She fights for our freedom. Please take the time, meet her afterward, talk to her. She won an amazing case. Did you talk about that? Okay, yeah, it's awesome, awesome, awesome things that the Lord's using her. Please talk to her. Get, this, get the speakers, they get, get their phone numbers, try to schedule them to come to your church and to, to put awareness and to educate more of us. Amen? Let's stand up and we can close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much, Lord, for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for this great brothers and sisters, Lord, that they came and share with us today. I do pray, Lord, that you anoint them, you continue to use them. Lord, I do pray for all of us here. Lord, I pray safe traveling as we go from here. Lord, I do pray. I do pray, Lord, that you uh, move us, Lord, to not just to be hearers, like just hearing this training and learning and watching more videos, but to turn these things that, that we're learning to action, to reach out to the Muslims next door to us, to the Muslims that you're going to arrange for them to sit next to us in an airplane, or to the gas station cashier that we've been going for years and we ignored him, Lord. I pray, Lord, that help us to see in these last days as we see things going so crazy, Lord. I pray that you may use us to be light around the people that are around us, Lord Jesus, that you help us, Lord, to, to share about you, to point to you, Lord Jesus, to be willing to stand and defend the faith, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity that you're giving us today to have uh, Jay and David and all these people, Lord, to come and help us here to learn. Lord, I do pray as we go, Lord, be with us. Uh, give us a great night, uh, rest tonight, and bring us back tomorrow safely. I do lift our brother Anthony, Lord Jesus. I pray, Lord, that uh, you will just help him to be able to communicate tomorrow. And very well, Lord Jesus, that you will speak, Lord, toward, through him, Lord Jesus, to the Muslims that are going to be watching the debates tomorrow, Lord. We thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, last thing. Last saying, if you have a Muslim friend that you have a phone number for him in your phone, please come to me to get a link to send them to watch the debate. Please text message them. Would you join us tomorrow for this debate free of charge? Join us, watch this debate tomorrow, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. Remember, there's table.